This is BBC One in colour. I am the spirit of dark and lonely water. By the beginning of the 1970s, a new kind of dark, cynical nihilism had began to creep into mainstream popular culture. The age of peace and free love had ended, and the 1960s countercultures had begun to show their dark side. This became reflected in horror cinema of the time, with movies like Witchfinder General, The Wicker Man, The Last House on the Left, Night of the Living Dead and Rosemary's Baby portraying godless, hopeless worlds in which the characters don't necessarily live happily ever after. But this nightmarish view of the world wasn't just restricted to adult horror cinema. Perhaps most surprisingly, it began seeping its way into mainstream television, not just late night TV plays for adults, but prime time family viewing. Programmes that were hugely popular at the time, like The Tomorrow People and Doctor Who, were also giving its young audiences nightmares. And soon enough, there was a growing trend of strange, uncanny rural horror that began to dominate kids' TV. Programmes that, in the great tradition of folk horror, may appear light and harmless on the surface, yet they had something else, something very dark, sinister and unnerving, bubbling just underneath. Join me as we continue exploring the evolution of folk horror, and we take a closer look at the bleak world of folk on the small screen. Welcome back to the Evolution of Horror. My name is Mike, and as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres across a number of weeks. We are currently in the midst of exploring the evolution of folk horror, and this is part four, in which, now that we've done the main unholy trinity of films, we're going to branch away from cinema and into television. This is going to be a spoiler-free roundup of a whole bunch of British rural folk horror stemming from the late 60s, early 70s, and all the way through to its influences on modern-day mainstream American television shows such as American Horror Story and True Detective. So loads and loads of interesting stuff to cover. But before we get started, here are a few contact details. You can email us. The email address is evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter at evolutionpod or on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash evolutionofhorror. And don't forget, you can also follow us on Letterboxd. That's letterboxd.com slash evolutionpod. And that's where you can keep up to date with an ever-growing list of folk horror titles that we are going to be covering in depth. Now, before we get started on our journey through television folk horror, I've got a very special treat for you. Somebody who I love to get on the podcast at least once every series to hear her very unique and very interesting, insightful, psychoanalytic take on each subgenre of horror. It is my great pleasure to welcome back to the podcast for a third time the wonderful Freudian cinephile herself, Mary Wilde. Mary, welcome. Hello, nice Hello. to be back. Yeah, lovely to have you back. Thank you. Um, so last time you were here, we were talking about ghosts and all of that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, ghosts and, and slashers, uh, they're in, in some ways quite easy to define. Mm. Whereas I think what we're doing at the moment, folk horror, is a bit of a weird one, isn't it? There's, there's you know, different people have different impressions of what folk horror is. Yeah. Um, what, what are your thoughts? On, on this sort of subgenre? Well, I have to say, I find that um, there's something uniquely psychoanalytic about folk horror. Yeah. Um, particularly the fact that there's this association with it, uh, you know, with the tribal and yes. the rooted. Yes. Um, when And then, of course, in the horror genre, it, the tribe sort of turns out to be savage. Mm. Um and there's all this stuff about associations with this with the countryside and how it might actually harbor forgotten cruelties, yeah. you know, this element of nature. Mm -hmm. It kind of reminds me a little bit of like Antichrist as yeah. well. What yeah. Lars von Trier says that uh, nature is Satan's church or something like that you know mm -hmm. something about nature having that uh vicious dangerous dimension to it yeah that's it there's there's always a feeling in in, in these films where it's like where nature should be respected and, yeah. and feared almost yeah. as well yeah. exactly yeah but also i think the main thing about horror that 
or folk horror that I find very pred- predominantly psychoanalytic is that it's so connected to the old ways that are untouched with modernity, you know, yes. untouched by modernity and yes. the, all these half remembered rituals and it's so connected to the past. It's, yeah. it's really touching on something that is sort of dormant in our collective unconscious. Mm. Th- these sort of remnants of memories and you know half remembered rituals that yeah. we're trying to work out, and they sort of manifest themselves in this sort of eerie uh, yet familiar mm. landscape of nature. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, and do you think there's something? You know, inherently, mm. is there something inherently British about folk <laughs> horror, or can or can it kind of exist anyway? Because I think a lot of people associate it, don't yeah. they, with British cinema of the sort of sixties and seventies, yeah, exclusively kind of almost. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? But then, you know, we, we're going to talk about films that maybe sort of go out beyond that. Yeah. But, but um, predominantly, there's something very British about it, isn't there? Is there <laughs> something about our history? We've got quite a dark, <laughs> macabre history in a way, haven't we? That's I don't know if that's got something yeah. to do with it. And yeah. in a way, the the folk horror genre gives you like this very unique language to explore yeah. that, that Britishness that mm. sort of quaint um, you know th- something that's both enticing mm-hmm. uh, but also threatening mm. you know th- it's that combination of the two this ambivalent space yes. that captures everything yes. and I think I mean myself being Canadian so I'm like you know a, a bit like poised to be able to comment yeah, yeah, um, yeah. you know from an outsider's perspective of the British culture and this specific connection with folk horror I think that um, maybe this subgenre is touching on, I guess, the question of tradition mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, h- how it endures. Yeah, that's it. It's like how our history lingers exactly. on, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And it's interesting. I mean, I don't know how much you've, because obviously we we we're in London right now. <laughs> uh, how you know? How, what's been your experience? Have yeah. you ventured out into? <laughs> Middle England, right? Because there's, yeah. there's, uh, I find, <laughs> I don't want to offend the people here, but I've travelled around a lot for work and I'm always shocked at, you know, yeah. suddenly you'll drive around through a, a village and they will be everywhere kind of, you know, I remember during the whole Brexit campaign, a lot of kind of UKIP posters. Yeah. And, and you, you, you know, in our little liberal London bubble, you forget that there's a vast majority of the country that has still quite old fashioned traditions sure. or points of view, or maybe you're a little bit more insular or isolated, that kind of thing. Mm. And there's something kind of, again, quite scary about that, I think. Isn't there? Yeah, it is a little bit. Mm. Uh, and I think, you know, this is the thing about uh, the, the subgenre. It's sort of, in a way, it's poking at the fact that a lot of people are, you know, dwelling in urban spaces. Yes, um, yes. Particularly, like, maybe film freaks, uh, yeah. you know? Yeah, definitely. Uh, There's always got to be something urban about people into arts or something, isn't Right, there? you know, there's yeah. that connection. Yeah. And so this sort of sticks out and anything that's sort of natural, not mechanical and maybe clinging to the past yes. is perceived as, I don't know, I don't want to say archaic, mm. but there's there's this there's almost this kind of suspicion yeah. of why are these people um, so stubborn? Like, yeah. wh- why do they choose to pers- you know persistently live like this mm-hmm. when we have all the sort of luxuries of technology and mm. all these whims that we now enjoy as mo- as you know people dwelling in modern urban spaces? Yes. So th- it's almost like there's that little bit of. Um, trust that's chipped away Mm. when you see people in this day and age you know living in a very different way yeah absolutely yeah i wonder if there's something there's something what i find quite scary about these movies is that sometimes a lot of the horror feels very everyday it's just part of these communities so which finder general just starts with a woman sort of being dragged through the streets and then hanged in public and everyone just kind of stands around and watches and is complicit and then they sort of go back to their daily business kind of thing and (laughs) you know the wicker man it's like the entire island Mm. just take as read that they're going to burn a man to death and that's what they do and there's this feeling of like a collective psyche or something isn't there this kind of like and I suppose it maybe links to what might have been going on at the time in the sort of 60s and 70s with cults and, yeah. you know that that kind of weird Absolutely. cult mentality I suppose isn't it I mean what is it about us is there <laughs> some you know weird kind of um you know tendency to want to join a group or community or follow or you know almost almost sacri- like get rid of our individuality or something Absolutely I think yeah. you're touching on something that actually is picked up in 
uh, one of Freud's uh, monographs mm. called Group Psychology and the An Analysis of the Ego, which mm -hmm. was published in 1921. Oh, cool. And here Freud is really taking all of his practice and research and findings that he's uh, developed through working with individuals in psychotherapy. Mm. And he's taking all the information that he's built up and then all this knowledge about the human psyche at an individual level and really kind of blowing it up and extrapolating more about groups. Mm. This paper preceded his uh, manifesto of 1930, uh, Civilization and Its Discontents, where yeah. he really took a kind of s social psychology perspective and applied psychoanalysis to study civilization at large. Oh, cool. But before he did that, in this paper about group psychology, mm. he was interested to actually try and understand this phenomenon that you just described, which is mm. groupthink. Yeah, groupthink, you know? exactly. Yeah. Um, what, you know, what makes people, individuals, uh, behave a certain way, often in a very synchronized way, yeah. uh, in masses of people. Mm -hmm. And this paper really looks at ma um, psychological mechanisms in mass movements. Mm -hmm. What he did was he actually referred a lot to the work of the sociologist Gustave Le Bon. Mm -hmm. And... Um, he said that as part of the mass, the individual acquires a sense of infinite power mm. um, that allows him or her to act on impulses that they'd otherwise have to curb as an isolated individual. Right. So what the group is really doing is that it's given, giving the individual a sense of kind of feelings of power and security, allowing them not to not only to act as part of a mass, but also to feel safety in numbers. Yes. So it's this kind of reassuring thing where there's all these dormant, unconscious impulses mm -hmm. that we want to act up, but we can't yeah. on our own because it, it's too, we'd be too singled out. But if it's mm -hmm. a mass movement of people doing it, and if there's like this kind of group hysteria, which mm -hmm. we often see in these folk horror films. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. You know? Um, and often moral panic is associated yes. with that. It's all these extremes. It's all. It's either like really rigid, almost like Victorian, very, very strict, very moralistic attitudes mm -hmm. to completely the opposite, like the photographic negative and its wild sex and field yes. orgies. And yes. <laughs> so it's yes. a very. It's so dichotomous in that way. Yes. Um, and basically, um, just to go on with the paper, yeah. um, he said that Freud said this, this is accompanied by when the individual sort of integrates in that way in a mass movement. Um, what does happen is that they sort of lose their conscious personality, their ego. Mm. Um, and there's a tendency of the individual to be infected by any emotion within the mass. Right. I like that word infected. I yes. feel like it has a lot of horror It does. It sounds like, it's, like, it's like a zombie type situation exactly. again, isn't it? Which is a kind of similar thing, yeah, actually, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And and so what what then happens is that emotionally there's this sort of back and forth. There's like this feed, feedback loop mm -hmm. of emotions going on in, in the group mm. where people are mirroring each other. Um, and there's this kind of unconscious identification that also takes place between the individuals of the mass and their leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, now often we do see mm. um, in full car, you know, there is a sort of person a, 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 at the top of a hierarchy. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, and for them, what's b the binding element between the individuals uh, and the leader is actually what... Um, the way the, the way that they each individual is emotionally reacting in the same way they find mm. solace in that mm -hmm. so it's like they're seeing somebody have an emotion and they then feel validated to have the same emotion and it binds mm. them together okay yeah. um, and this is also what goes on in cults as well yeah I mean you mentioned um, the, the sort of prevalence of sacrifice in a lot of folk horror yes and I think that you know the the representation of people getting killed sacrificially mm -hmm. really, w I think, stands in for the unconscious sacrifice the individual makes of their own conscious personality when they join a group like that. Mm. So they're actually making this choice, this unconscious choice of, in a way, uh, severing the ties between their autonomy mm. uh, and themselves for the sake of belonging to that group and then it's 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 sort of liberating in one way because they're then um, they they're sort of absolved of free will. They can yeah. just go with the wave of what's happening, you know, in the story. Yes, and they don't really have to be held accountable. Yes, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, it's really interesting because again, it's the, usually the fear comes from that that 
one outsider, that one person yeah, who's, exactly. who's, who's found themselves trapped in this community in some way and can't escape. Again, the Wicker Man is the perfect example exactly. there where they're literally cut off on this island and there's no yeah. escape. You know, it's really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, th- and this th- the sort of arrival of the stranger, the yeah. outsider, this, this really is a recurring archetype in folk horror. Mm-hmm. Um, that this, you know, someone's kind of stumbled in yes. and, and discovered the secret cult. Yes. And there, then there's maybe vicious murders and often a sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And I think that in a way, it's a very useful narrative trope to have the outsider because we're coming in as viewers. Yes, they're kind of the our same, guides. Exactly. Yeah, it's so, it's so it's true. It's our discovery as well. Absolutely. But I think that there's often this kind of tension yeah. uh, that's going on between actually maybe on maybe on three dimensions on sort of enlightened rationalism, mm-hmm. uh, religion, mm or blind faith and then paganism yes and there's this kind of these three are sort of jockeying for position Mm -hmm. um and and certainly in the wicker man it seems that the paganism is dominating there you know um and i wonder if that just is uh, a story that's trying to tell um you know the the, i guess maybe the suffering that takes place unconsciously Mm. while this tension goes on Mm. and how um, nature wills us to uh, overthrow this piousness, this sort of yes. moralism, you know, yes. yeah, and yeah. that actually nature is operating at a, on a very different level. Yes. There's this freedom. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, um, there is. Yeah. So, so the sacrifice of the burning, mm-hmm. then uh, particularly also the, the sort of... Uh, what is that structure they've built? You know, it's it's, it's an amazing, yes, this massive kind of effigy thing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And he's inside. Yes. You know. Yes. That's so, that's so interesting to me. Just topographically, like mm-hmm. the visuals of that and the structures of that and the psyche. Mm. It's like it's, it's kind of like telling us to like burn the cop inside your head. Yes. You know? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's so true. Yeah. It's really interesting. I mean, I wonder as well. Where? I mean, what do you? What's your take on the yeah. kind of gender um, mm. uh, portrayal? This, a freedom that's afforded to the female characters in that film yes. and how kind of acknowledging um, really the I guess a side of femininity and femaleness yes. that often is v- very suppressed yes, in exactly. a lot of culture Yeah, and so this is now giving it just really um, th- th- this absolute liberty of expression yeah. and kind of making it again look kind of every day yeah you know? Yeah, exactly. It's not taboo. No, they're not. They're actually. They don't have complexes about it. Yeah, and so the reactions to that really are just highlighting maybe individuals' own hang-ups. Exactly. Yeah, yeah it's so interesting. Yeah, and <laughs> and again, it's kind of a lot of the time these because the, I think sex does play a big part in a lot of these folk horrors because yeah. again, it's almost like this kind of fear of you know <laughs> of, of it's almost a bit of a fear of sex. I suppose these films have in a sense because it's, yeah. it's sort of saying this is alien. You know that these people are so um, sort of liberated. Sex actually you know yeah. orgies are, are not a big deal and and i suppose again you know you, you stereotypically so many western films are mm. quite you know have these kind of base sort of moral christian yes. values i suppose and uh but actually also um blood on satan's claw yeah uh is it linda hayden yes oh my god as She's angel a, yeah smoldering incredible. seductress just incredible yeah amazing yeah, yeah. performance yeah but the fact that she's you know it's it's her character that sort of brings this evil, you know, mm. and it, it I think it really stands in for her status as this kind of uh, erotic young woman. Yes, and th- th- this kind of language of the horror, you know, folk horror is affording us a way to confront mm-hmm. our own fears with the, with the potential she presents. Yeah, in this very. Uh, let's say, very rigid community. Um, I mean, just going back to Freud's paper on group psychology and the analysis of the ego, he actually made a distinction between two types of masses. Mm. And he said the same mental processes occur in both. Yeah. He highlighted, firstly, the short-lived mass, which is rapidly transient um, in interest. And he actually gave an example of trends. And mm. I, so he was actually, you know... <laughs> <laughs> He was actually like uh, talking about Twitter before it was a thing, you know? Love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, But then he said there's a more permanent and enduring type of mass that's highly organized Mm. and highly structured and very rigid in its morals. And it has a lot of kind of uh, the properties of the superego. And he actually named the church as that, Mm. the church and the military. Yes. And these are actually, and they create propaganda in order to ensure 
um, that people, you know, don't uh, break the lines, mm. you know, that they, they don't uh, transgress the boundaries of the organization. Yes. There's all these reminders and fears instilled in members of that group. Mm-hmm. And I think that um, in a way, folk horror is a great language mm. for um, challenging, you know, challenging these uh, yeah. very rigid boundaries. Hello, everyone. This is Mike here from the future, just momentarily interrupting to warn you that in the next couple of minutes, we talk about M. Night Shyamalan's movie The Village from 2004 in spoilerific detail. We talk about that movie very briefly, but we do mention what happens at the end, including some big twists. So I just wanted to make sure if there is anyone out there who still hasn't yet seen The Village from 2004 and doesn't want to be spoiled, if I were you, I would skip ahead on your podcast about four minutes because we are about to go in depth. Let that be your warning. I mean, another film that comes to mind is M. Night Shyamalan's The, the Village. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's an interesting one. Yeah. And I think that um, the, the fact that the elders have, yes. you know, come together and form these, f- basically form this uh, narrative, this story about uh, the history of their village and mm-hmm. they're in- indoctrinating the younger ones. It's all predicated on fear. It is. It is. And con- and it, it's a control, control as well, isn't it? Again, yeah. a very cult-like thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, e- very cult-like. Even though I suppose they, they are in a effect you know in the film kind of keeping them safe i suppose but they're yeah, not are they no. yeah it's interesting they're just controlling them and lying to them yeah yeah exactly yeah. um and and i love the fact that in that film mm. um it's the young woman who's blind who yes. has this amazing courage and yeah. she sort of defies the expectations of her society yeah. and she she breaks down those barriers she can see the truth yeah yeah, it's yeah really exactly interesting. and it is again it's that funny thing of because there's this like we said there's this kind of fear of the old and the yeah. old ways except that this the village kind of subverts that because it's about these elders exactly. that that want to go back to the old ways they yeah. kind of that's what they that's what they think they need you know yeah to be rid of modern modern day life and society and that kind of thing exactly they've decided um you know they've seen suffering and tragedy in their own lives mm-hmm. and rather you know, then con- instead of like confronting that and coming to terms with it and really processing the trauma, mm. what they want to do is is completely sanitize, yes. uh, you know, a society for their children to, yes. to grow up in. And in a way, that is just a recipe for some of the most uh, undesirable psychological problems you would yeah, want. Yeah, yeah. Because really, that that sheltering mm. um, is really um, not, not going to afford... Uh, members of the the society with the survival skills that they need in order to cope with the inevitable tragedy that comes and Mm. trauma that comes um so yeah and i think it's it's kind it is in in, in a sense it is um interesting when we see that so much of the film we think that is taking place in the 18th or 19th century yes but actually you know yes spoiler alert it is a spoiler alert yeah 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 yeah. (laughs) it isn't at all um and i this again is something that really uh fascinates me about folk horror is this um i guess engagement with the past yes so much of psychoanalysis is about confronting one's own past memories Mm -hmm. and those kind of things that we've repressed about ourselves Mm. all those things that lay dormant and unconscious yes and this is a wonderful um lexicon and network of images that affords us a way to to confront that yeah it is and it's like um it's it's interesting you know t- talking about it alongside w- when we used to talk about ghost movies because yeah. again it kind of deals with memory and yeah. um you know what came before but whereas that is is more spiritual this is much more earthy tangible exactly. it's more like memories yeah. in the soil in Ex- the ground in the, in the you know and it, i think that also links to you know the sex and the nakedness and yeah. the, everything is kind of tangible and earthy about <laughs> exactly. these films in a weird way i can't, can't find a better way to describe yeah. it but you know what i mean it's yeah it's not of... this abstract sort of specter yeah it's, it's, it's you know what's right in front of you mm. and in the village what's amazing um about that film is the use of color for instance so mm-hmm. red is banned yes and you know they, they, they try to instill this fear of the color red yes. and if they see like a little fl- flower you know that that, that um 
that they find in the garden or something that's yes. red, they, their first instinct is to bury it. Yeah. And the burial is, for me, psychoanalytically interesting because that is about repression and Absolutely. covering up and Absolutely. denial, you know, out of sight, out of mind, this scotomization, this kind of um, narrowing of the field of vision. And even in, the, in that film, in the village, um, the inhabitants, they live in fear of creatures beyond, you know, the woods. Mm-hmm. Th- those creatures are referred to those we don't speak of. Yes, that's right. Yes, you know? so yes, it's, yes. It's th- that's interesting to me as well mm-hmm. because as soon as something is nameless, and you're, it's even in your language that you mustn't, ref- you know, make any reference to it, or it's yep. a forbidden taboo subject. Yeah. Right away, you're in the area of repression. Absolutely, yeah, it's so interesting, and it is so often. These movies are about, um, you know, there was. Uh, I was talking to someone else about how, you know, essentially, yeah. you know, back, you know, however many hundreds or thousands of years ago, this was pagan. Uh, you know, Great Britain was a pagan <laughs> island, and then yeah. what's happened is it's literally been buried. You know, a lot of That's these right. kind of. Uh, you know, w- places of worship have been replaced by churches, or literally yeah. built on top of some of these old pagan sort of grounds and so that true. kind of thing. And it is, uh, yeah, it's it's things that are, have literally been repressed beneath the soil. And you know, blood on Satan's claw begins with a man <laughs> accidentally uncovering That's beneath right. the soil this kind of creature, yeah. this skeleton of this you know demon That's or whatever right. it is. So it is again, it's that tangible thing tangible, that things are earthy, buried beneath yeah. the earth. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Still sort of lingering and old. Yeah, yeah. just beneath us. It's so interesting. I love that. It's it, it kind of paints this picture almost of archaeology. You know, that, yeah. this idea that if you go digging, mm. you're going to find something. Some of them, you know, might be unpleasant. Yeah. Actually, Freud was a big fan of archaeology. He was a really mm. inter- he was really interested in the science. Oh, interesting. And he, yeah. he said that psychoanalysis and archaeology have a lot in common because in both instances, uh, it's a case of digging away layers of soil. Mm-hmm. You know, either in in actual earth or in the person's mind, you yeah. know, layers and layers, and constantly finding um, objects, mm. um, symbols, and on their own, they might not make sense. But once you excavate enough objects, mm-hmm. you can then start to piece them together. And then that tells you a story about the past. Ah, oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, and I love how that really translates in, in folk horror. As you it say, does. it's so tangible and earthy. It absolutely does. And I, and, I, and again, I wonder if that it emphasizes the, the Britishness of it because, yes. you know, I suppose countries like America are relatively yeah. new countries in yeah. a way. They have much less exactly. history than we do. Whereas you drive around England and you'll still see Stonehenge and, yeah. you know, all of these kind of relics yeah. and old architecture and yeah. the history is still all around us, exactly. I suppose. So it's, still it's always there. a reminder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that there's a lot of dark history everywhere, all around yeah. us kind of thing. Yeah. It's really interesting. And yeah, I mean, uh, going back to the, the, the blood on Satan's claw thing yeah. as well, I was thinking as well about how, I suppose uh, it reminds me of when we talked about movies like Carrie and things oh, yeah. where it's like fear of a teenager's fear of their own bodily changes yeah. whereas this is more like an adult's fear of teenagers you know isn't it from a different point of view Absolutely. that they're all evil <laughs> yeah yeah and also that you know the the, the transformation that they're going through mm. is is sort of outside of the domain of their control yeah yeah that's the thing you know it's that um w- once adults re- reach a certain age mm. um they're you know they're Physically, they may not transform that much, n- at least not so rapidly. Yeah. But in the case of teenagers, with you know so many changes in the body yes. and hormones and new discoveries mm. and you know the motivation to to keep you know that curiosity alive. Yeah. Um, it 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 poses a problem yes. for the establishment because it's uncontrollable. Yes. <laughs> it's interesting, like you said, you know, p- figures like the you know um, military and the church might be thought of as a kind of super ego, and mm. I suppose teenagers are like the id. You know, that yeah. kind of a thing. Yes, isn't it? I love that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That, that, that are trying to be squashed, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the village is a great one. Any other sort of film titles that you want yes. to talk about? Yeah, actually, I do have a couple more. Um, Actually, I thought I recently saw Michael Pierce's film Beast. Oh, I'm so, I'm dying to see this. I uh, haven't seen it yet. Yeah, I really recommend it. Yes, I, I mean it's not. I would say it is uh, very much um, a psychological thriller film, mm-hmm. but there are a lot of uh, horror tropes in it. Yeah, and it's about a troubled woman living in an isolated community mm-hmm. in Jersey who finds herself pulled between the control of her oppressive family and the allure of a secretive outsider 
who's suspected of a series of brutal murders. Right, yeah, yeah. So you see it right away. There's a very, um, I think, a, there's a lot of similarities there. Yeah, definitely. With, with, with folk horror, definitely. especially when we think of some, you know, some communities in places like islands, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, you know, Jersey being one of them that may sometimes uh, tend more toward like the parochial, you definitely, know, yeah. and a little bit more traditional mm. and very kind of insular. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I suppose... I, I know that the film is based on an actual serial killer, the Jersey Beast. Right, right, yeah. But I think it's it's it's, it's sort of loosely based on that story. Mm. And what I loved about this is that it's, it just creates this kind of really incredible contrast between the dramatic, um, sh- you know, shorelines of Jersey mm. and how wild and, and gorgeous they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also... You know, then this community, uh, very sort of residential, suburban, mm. very closed in. Um, everyone is sort of aware of each other. There's a lot of sort of, um, I guess, silent policing going on, silent yeah. policing of behavior. Yeah. Um, and this young woman uh, had a troubled sort of childhood and adolescence. Right. So her parents keep her under, you know, um, a, a strict control. Yeah. And... I guess what for me what makes this a, maybe a little bit uh, like folk horror yeah. is that um, th- she she sort of is dealing with the tension of so much uh, pressure from her community yeah and maybe the excitement of someone who has a dangerous side and might have been connected to a series of murders of young girls mm-hmm. so even entering a relationship with this person she there is that risk because mm-hmm. you know she, she could be a target for him mm. potentially and we're yeah. not even sure whether it is him or not right yeah yeah so it it's sort of um oh, i wish yeah there's so many wonderful scenes actually of her um in in the woods and lying on the ground mm. and like sinking her her hands in the soil oh, and yeah. just there's so much connection with uh with nature yeah and then that being sort of then taking on connotations of of sin. Yes, interesting. You know? yeah, yeah, how yeah. she's always wearing these really pristine, light colored outfits. Mm-hmm. So when she goes and uh, has these moments in nature, mm. she comes back and she's soiled. Mm-hmm. You yeah, know? And she, you know she really stands out in her community. Uh, interesting. Sort of, yeah, yeah. It's because I've heard. I've, I'm dying to see it actually, but yeah. I've read. I've read that it's got kind of um, fairy tale yeah. sort of visual flourishes and that kind of thing as well. Oh, yes. And again, I think that's something that you can link to folk. I think so. um, we're going to be talking about the movie The Night of the Hunter and things like oh, that. And yeah. they've even though it's not technically folk, it's it's definitely got those elements where it's very heavily on nature and it's got a kind of fairy. tale tail in the woods almost yeah. like Hansel and Gretel or yeah. something kind of feel to it and again they all have those sort of links with nature don't yeah, they yeah exactly yeah oh I'm dying to watch Beast yeah yeah so you'd recommend it highly highly mm. um, yeah particularly the performance of Jessie Buckley mm-hmm. yeah she she's really one to watch oh, really brilliant. exciting and the other one actually I wanted to mention which mm. really blew me away mm. um, is is actually a documentary Great. Um, it's called Holy Hell. It was yeah. released uh, two years ago, and uh, it's actually directed by Will Allen. And it's about um, the experiences of members of a cult called the Buddha, Buddha Field hmm. um, in California. Yeah. And basically, what happened is that um, there is this young man who uh, was asked to, when he joined that cult, um, he was asked to take footage. And be the sort of de facto videographer of the cult leader, right? Uh, because he was very skilled at video and stuff yeah. and, and, and camera work. And so, for twenty-two years that he was in this cult, oh my god, he was just filming all the time, you know, regularly yeah. um, activities, uh, sermons, all kinds of things. And then when he finally escaped, mm. um, he had all this footage, oh my god, which amazing, he, amazing. Yeah. and he pieced it all together and made this documentary and. It, th- I, I'm very excited about this film because it's it, it does tell a, a, such an amazing sort of first person account yeah. um, of people. There's there's a lot of interviews of other people who escaped as well, mm. but it has such a I think such a strong component of of folk horror. Yeah, there's so many activities in nature, mm. it, you know, in bodies of water, 
people sort of dancing around, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in the wild mm -hmm. and being at one with the cosmos, you know, this yeah, kind of thing. Absolutely. Doing drugs and feeling that they're like connected to nature. Yes. Um, and of course, Southern California has a big reputation for attracting a lot of people who are interested in cults. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know. It's so interesting. So is it a de so is it a dangerous cult then? This cult it that is he escapes because yeah. only mainly because the cult's leader um, ha is now claimed to have abused many of its followers. Right. Yeah. 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 Which is so odd. It always is the way, isn't it? Yeah. Always the way. Nice. Exactly. But I think that yeah, I think that in a way, all th the interest in cult is. Um, you know, in in, in, in a cults that people join and and this type of mentality where um, people are, I guess, members at the time. It's they're often they they can't really articulate what it is mm -hmm. that drove them to join. No, but unconsciously, especially watching this film, Holy Hell. Yeah, you really see Freud's what Freud was saying about um, you know, I guess the underpinnings of group psychology, mm -hmm. because really. There's the, the, the main process that's going on is that um, a mass as a group of people, um, they put the same object in the place of their ego ideal. Mm -hmm. So they, they sort of all start to identify with the same thing that they're all idealizing. Mm -hmm. And consequently, they then begin to identify with each other. Yes. And that's what really binds them together. They start to describe themselves as a family. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's all this, you know, like the Manson family. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, and there's, they feel like there's this psychological bond between them that can't be broken. Mm -hmm. And that they are... Um, Usually, it's 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 also people who who spend a lot of time in nature and away from, uh, you know, modernity and and, yeah. and technology. So it it feels like you know they convince themselves that they're, they're purified by nature. Yeah, um, that they're actually part of uh, of of something you know very holy and yeah. very noble. Mm -hmm. But actually, there's so much there's so much uh, brainwashing going on. Mm. And Freud actually talked about how. Um, often the identification can also take place with an aggressor, you know, an aggressive leader, yes. which obviously was prefiguring that research that's done on Stockholm Syndrome. Right, of course. Where yeah. hostages develop a psychological alliance with their captors, yeah. usually as a survival strategy at first. Yeah. But then over time, the longer they stay in that dynamic, that relationship dynamic, yeah. the more genuinely they'll say you know th they'll start to defend the aggressor mm. it's a very it's a very toxic um i guess uh adaptation emotional adaptation that takes place mm -hmm. because on some level they they probably don't want to admit to themselves um the damage that being a part of this group is doing to them yeah so it's probably easier just to uh start being persuaded that what they're doing is actually the right thing. Yeah. You know, th what they're doing is honorable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's so, yeah, it's fat. I do, uh, you know, I think we all find that kind of thing fascinating, don't we? You know, cults and that kind of thing. <laughs> I feel like there's been so much lately. There's been a lot of sort of true crime documentaries oh, on yeah. Netflix. Did you, I don't know if you saw Wild Wild Country, did you? I started Netflix? watching it. Yeah. It's very interesting. It's fascinating. And yeah. again, it's that. Because what, what, what's really interesting about it, I found, and again, maybe this is a biased documentary, I don't know, but mm. I think that it presents quite interesting um, arguments on both sides. Yeah. You know, what you've got is you've got this absolutely, it's almost like the extreme liberal versus the extreme conservative in that, because you've <laughs> got this, you know, kind of sex commune where they all yeah. are kind of live freely and, you know, all have, you know, orgies and drugs and all of that kind of thing, living side by side with this very, very kind of old fashioned conservative little yeah. town where they all carry guns and they're all you know uh, very christian and it's like it's these two extremes living next to each other what a contrast yeah and it is it's fascinating that it kind is. of thing and i suppose that's another thing about folk horror and these types of stories about cults and communes and you know it kind of reflects everything that america and britain i suppose yeah. are are scared of because it's this it's this kind of you're you're, you're losing your individuality it's yeah. linked to things like communism isn't it right because you're giving up <laughs> you're giving up capitalism and money a, a yeah, lot of the time yeah. as well and all of that kind of thing so it's yeah. rejecting all of that and then it's also rejecting god and christianity yeah. or whatever as well isn't it or you know modern religion absolutely. it's like everything that pe places like america are scared of yeah. in a way isn't it yeah yeah absolutely yeah 
And, you know, actually in, in Freud's book, Civilization and His Discontents, mm. um, this is where he was really talking about the tensions between the individual's quest for freedom yeah. and society's demand for conformity and repression. Yeah, yeah. Um, and how there's that conflict between the inner world and the expectations of society. Mm-hmm. And he, he actually warned, I mean, he, this, he published this in 1930, so he was already, as a Jewish man living in Vienna, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, he, he could already see, you know, the negative um, sort of um, impact of totalitarianism, right, that people yeah. were being singled out, etc. And he did warn that um, civilization, you know, on, on the surface seems like a wonderful thing, but he warned that if people are coming together for illegitimate reasons or inauthentic reasons, mm-hmm. that it will lead to hostility, violence, and isolation, hmm. and that ultimately it can create a frightening community, a dystopia. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, and he warned against um, this leading to dehumanization where people's individual autonomy is divested right um and then this is the ultimate decline in society yes so he was really uh, and this is one of the great kind of freudian ironies you know like he loved to point out these paradoxes Mm -hmm. where society is created to eliminate loneliness Mm -hmm. but actually um through the hip some of the hypocrisies of civilization it becomes the source of unhappiness Mm. it creates neurotic individuals Mm -hmm. because they're having to um try and comply with the expectations that are you know and standards that are that are put down for them yeah and in a way Folker is sort of resolving that tension, Mm -hmm. uh, often by amplifying the repression and hostility. Yes. Or the exact extreme opposite by creating this kind of rule free cinematic space where anything goes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the individual's autonomy is able to like reign free. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and it's so interesting. And again, I suppose it goes back to what we're talking about about how a lot of the time these these films you assume come from the point of view of somebody quite urbane. Yeah. Uh, Because again, you know, why is it that for some reason we we fear or are unnerved by the idea of being going back to our roots, literally our roots of of, of being you know just living off the land why is that a frightening prospect to us you know but it often is in these types of stories isn't it yeah we've been so civilized and we're so attached to those uh, things you know those objects and those sort of comforts Mm. uh, and our habits Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that the 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 prospect of as you say going back to our roots yeah getting back in touch with the ancient way of living yeah you know that connection with nature yes that does carry a very strong horror connotation yeah it sort of threatens this the personas we've created our Mm. identities yeah who are we now you know if we define ourselves a certain way now Mm -hmm. who are we if all of you know civilization is stripped away from us yes. where we really yes exactly absolutely yeah. you know yeah and it, it, you know and it's and it's so literal in these <laughs> movies isn't it literally stripped bare yeah. and at one with the earth and then who are we yeah it's so interesting and i suppose you know i think there's this subconscious you know, collective subconscious fear of nature yeah. that, you know, it is bigger and more powerful than us. And I think we like to think that we conquer it, you know, with building things yeah. and cars and flying around the world and flying to space. <laughs> and we think we we can control it. Right. But without that control where you are, you know, um, you, you know, you are a kind of a slave to the, your natural surroundings. Exactly. There's something frightening about that, isn't there? Absolutely. It's very unsettling. Very yeah. destabilizing. Yeah, destabilizing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's really interesting. It is. Do you have like a favorite favorite of this kind of subgenre do you think a favorite folk horror movie mm, I'd, I think I'd have to I think I would have to say The Village great yeah, yeah. Oh, that's really interesting The Village because yeah. a, a lot of people you know a lot of people don't like The Village yeah. don't they uh, you yeah. know M. Night Shyamalan has this reputation yeah. I need to give it a, a revisit because yeah. I haven't seen it in years now but um, <laughs> just talking about it is making me want to watch it again actually yeah no it's cool. and, and actually M. Night Shyamalan is beautiful like, he's, he, he shoots things beautifully he doesn't really he does. that's the thing yeah so stylish yeah and I love, I love how in this film, um, it's just there's so you, you start to learn the code of uh, symbols and colors mm-hmm. that are meant to be frightening. And so, mm. if it even subtly appears, it's it's actually quite terrifying. It yes. has a wonderful effect like that. He's a lot very of good at suspense, isn't yeah. he? He is really good at suspense. Yeah. I think he gets a lot of flack, and I think his flack, obviously, I think usually comes from the writing. I think people often yeah. have a problem with the, the dialogue, stories, the yeah. twists, the dialogue. When actually, with a camera, he's uh, brilliant. Yeah, he he's is very, very, very good. Yeah, 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 I agree. And I remember, I think it was, you know, that film was supposed to be his reaction to sort of post nine eleven America That's and right. that kind of thing, wasn't it? Yeah, a sense of I just want to. 
I just want to be away from this world yeah. and enclose myself yeah. off, you know? Denial. Denial, exactly. Yeah. Denial, repression. Yeah. 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 Ignore the surroundings. Yeah. yeah. So interesting. It is. Um, well, thank you so, so thank much you. for joining me once again. This has My been really pleasure. fascinating. Um, just for people out there, you know, is there anything that you've got coming up sort of um, event wise or anything else? I do. Uh, mm. I'm running a, a two day intensive course mm. at the Freud Museum in yeah. Hampstead um, on sci- science fiction cinema. Ooh, I've titled it outer space as inner space love it excellent <laughs> oh cool what what's what are some of the titles that you'd be exploring well i've got alien oh yeah amazing. Oh, yeah wonderful and a wonderful little film called cube Do oh, you know? i love yeah cube. the canadian film so yeah. clever that yeah. film it is it's really good yeah yeah and great for that kind of group psychology exactly. sociology element isn't totally. it really interesting yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. fantastic. So if people want to find you, where can they find you on social media to get details? Yeah, on that? On, I'm on Twitter. My handle is at Psychstar, P- mm-hmm. P-S-Y-C-S-T-A-R. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you so much. And there we have it. A huge thank you to the brilliant Mary Wilde. Such a treat to have her back on the podcast. And no doubt she will be back again very, very soon. Don't forget, if you want any information about any of Mary's upcoming courses or events, keep an eye on her on social media. All of her details will be in the show notes. Now, it's time to get into our journey through TV horror. As I mentioned, this is going to be spoiler free. We are not going to be talking about any titles in detail. It's just going to be a series of recommendations. A lot of these you may not have heard of. A lot of them you might have already seen, depending on how up on your sort of 70s British TV horror you are. But we've got absolutely loads of stuff to cover. So joining me to discuss some of this great small screen folk horror is somebody who's never been on the podcast before. I'm very, very excited to have him here. He is a horror writer and he's written a series of fantastic horror comics, including The Eerie, which I picked up a copy of and had a read. And it's absolutely fantastic with beautiful illustrations. And it's got a real feel of kind of British rural ghost story horror. So fantastic to have him here this week. Now, I went on a very special little pilgrimage to go and see him. He lives outside of London, can you believe? So I had to leave my little BFI broom cupboard and I ventured all the way out to the Garden of England, visited him in his 500-year-old house to sit down and chat all things folk horror with him. So here is my chat with the brilliant Tom Burgess. Okay, welcome to the podcast, Tom Burgess. Tom, welcome. Thanks, Mike. It's really good to be here. Yeah, so lovely to have you here at last. This is uh, this is exciting because we're, we're, well, I like to think I'm kind of out in the sticks right now. You might hear if you're listening to this, there's a sort of bird song going on outside. <laughs> uh, we're, we're not in London. I think this is the first podcast I've, uh, I've not recorded in London, although it's not really in the sticks. We're in Canterbury, so it's a, a lovely, beautiful old city. Um, <laughs> how long have you lived here? Uh, I've pretty much lived in and around Canterbury most of my life. Have uh, you? So yeah, I've, I've worked up in London for uh, quite a few years mm. uh, doing freelance design and animation. But we'll talk about this more in a, in a bit. But you know, do you like that Canterbury? Canterbury is obviously very much known for its kind of history. It's, it's a very old, old city, isn't it? And it does feel like when you wander around the streets, it has that history is still there everywhere around, isn't it? It does. Yeah, uh, it's really interesting. It's that Canterbury is actually like the birthplace of the modern ghost story. So. Huh. Yeah, like uh, in 1706, uh, Daniel Defoe wrote The Apparition of Mrs. Veal, which is based on a haunting in Canterbury, allegedly. Mm. So, and that supposedly went on to inspire like M.R. James and E.F. Benson. So, yeah, it's kind of really got its roots in uh, in kind of paganism and uh, and ghost stories, I guess. But it's something really the cathedral aren't too keen to promote. So it's kind of kept yeah, under wraps. Of course. Yeah, of course. That's, that's brilliant, isn't it? Uh, and, and we're in your house right now. And your house is like, what were you saying? It's like hundreds of years old. Is that right? Uh, yeah, the, well, the downstairs section's definitely 15th century, oh. uh, and then this section's like, well, this is an old converted Huguenot building, so it's like it would have been a part of a Huguenot weaver's loft. Amazing. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty old. It's very, I love it, I love it. It feels like this is very, this is what I wanted for the folk horror series to be, you know, out and about somewhere, somewhere a bit old, a bit <laughs> interesting, not just at the BFI for once, it's brilliant. Um, so, first of all, tell me a little bit about yourself then, what do you do for people who don't know you? Uh, so I write comics and graphic novellas um, and 
primarily the ghost stories but i've got a real love of folk horror so there's always the folkloric elements in it and uh and yeah folk horror different uh areas i guess so yeah yeah i've just recently read one of yours the eerie that's beautiful i absolutely loved it really really stunning thanks thanks um so does it tend to do they tend to all be sort of similar sort of themes like say ghost stories that kind of thing yeah so i've always really loved ghost stories um and i was really fascinated with playing around with getting a a ghost story in a comic medium Mm. um so I've done three in total, Malevolence and The Eerie and Hallows Fell. Um, and uh, and yeah, it's been great fun. Um, they all follow some sort of folkloric aspect. Yeah. Um, and I've got real fascination with folklore. Um, and obviously it's something which I think is really current with, um, you know, the Folklore Thursday movement. Yeah. Which has gone kind of crazy worldwide. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just been really fun to do. And um, yeah, really, really honoured to have people like, um, you know, Reece Shearsmith. Yes. Was so nice to give me a forward on uh, the Erie and Corin Hardy um, who did the forward on my last comic yes as well, so. Corin Hardy who's, who's directed The Hallow a great folk horror movie and he's yes. directing the upcoming uh, film of The Nun isn't he oh in The Conjuring God. Universe that trailer incredible so incredible yeah 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 um again very kind of looks quite folk horrorish doesn't it yeah yeah it's really nice to see uh the feedback seems to be kind of like oh this looks really different to the rest of the country yeah universe, which is Thank exciting goodness. yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah no i can't wait so obviously by the sounds of it you know you're a big fan of ghost stories mr james that kind of thing i take it you're a big horror movie fan are you what's your relationship like with the horror genre yeah huge huge um mm. going way back uh being you know going into video rental shops and being way too young to rent any of the horror stuff yeah but, the but usual kind of, exactly and standing in front of like shelves of you know beautiful artwork oh. uh you know stuff like house and amityville and you know like uh hellraiser and just being like oh my god what is within the confines of this tiny case mm. um so yeah um most definitely always long been fascinated with it um but certainly from a tv aspect um, I guess some of my earliest memories are like M.R. James, the adaptations. Right, yes, yes, so, yes. Yeah, like that really stick with you and probably slightly traumatising in a in a great way, though. Yeah, did you did you grow up watching a lot, uh, you know, that kind of sort of, because obviously that's what we're going to be talking about this week. Did you did you watch a lot of this kind of strange TV horror when you were growing up? Yeah, um, it's something which is really interesting because um, I know it's been talked about recently quite a lot, which mm. is like hauntology, which is this whole kind of movement um about you know kind of weird retro tv and yeah. especially children's tv like um like children of the stones yes yes or like even stuff like uh bagpuss and um you know peter <laughs> Furman, po- uh, oliver postgate um i mean they literally did their films down the road in Blean. Mm. um so uh and that kind of it's got that weird sort of melancholy disquiet to it yeah um so yeah i, I mean that's from my child i grew up in the 80s and that was definitely you know the staple of tv seemed to be stuff like that and uh mm. and you know like even even films kind of be uh, were like stuff like labyrinth and yes. um, the muppets so everything was yeah, slightly dark crystal and stuff yeah. weird stuff yeah slightly off kilter yeah um, so yeah like that sense of the uncanny always kind of felt very much pro- predominant back then mm-hmm. so what about folk horror then specifically i mean what, what are your thoughts on folk horror and and how does it differ to you know what you might call the traditional ghost story then in your opinion do you think yeah sure i suppose um, with folk horror um and its foundations it's horror set within a rural community mm, um, where the definitely. Th- threat stems from something old rising uh, to affect like the modernity um or modern life which is carried through the sensibility uh fears and traditions of the community around it so um, you know, certainly in The Wicker Man, you know, uh, you've got Edward Woodward going into a setting where it's so alien to him. But there's a, you know, there's a very predominant non-Christian theme going on throughout yes. it. Very paganistic. Um, and, it's you know, it's that fear of the outsider, I guess. Yeah. And vice versa. Um, but yeah, definitely, certainly, um, it's something which is dark and old rising up. Absolutely, um, looking to affect modern life, definitely. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 because because you know it, there is a fine line sometimes between um, the sort of ghost story, the old you know M.R. James style ghost story, and folk horror. Mm. And I think there's something, um, you know, it, it, it's almost like if ghost stories, you know, are to do with uh, are kind of more spiritual. There's something more earthy about folk horror, something more tangible about it in a way, isn't there? Yeah. Um, and and you're right, it tends to involve entire communities. And there's definitely kind of a sense of isolation as well. I think that, you know, they're either set in sort of, you know, old sort of period settings where I suppose travel was much more difficult. And so people did tend to stick to their own little English village, you know, and and, and that would be it. And that would maybe they'd never leave there. Uh, Or, you know, if it is set in the modern day, it's got to be in some way 
isolating. So the Wicker Man on an island or, you know, sometimes it might be set in some sort of commune or something, something where you still get that sense of isolationism yeah. and people still live in the old way, I suppose. Yeah, it's really interesting. Absolutely, yeah. Like, um, literally, I, well, I suppose like the village, you know, it's that kind of it's that setting where, you know, you've got modern life going on, but you've got this also this really weird... Um, medieval village that exists within its own realm um, mm-hmm. but yeah certainly it's um to me it's it's that kind of it's that kind of fear uh you know ghost stories quite often bleed into it and certainly a lot of the mr james stuff does um and you know a lot of the ghost stories on tv have kind of played around with the folk horror aspects mm. to it but yeah the the uh, yeah at their core i suppose the two very fundamental horrors but um yeah, yeah both equally terrifying So as we mentioned at the beginning, there was there was this kind of wave, wasn't there, by the sounds of it, of 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 TV with this kind of strange folk uncanniness to it throughout the sixties and seventies, wasn't there, and eighties? Yeah, most definitely. Um, you know, and I, I think that stemmed bizarrely stemmed through from children's TV right through to you know the TV adaptations mm. and, and like the Hammer films. Um, yeah, it was it was crazy to see such like a wealth of it um i guess that really was triggered by as you say like the holy trinity the blood and yeah. Satan's Girl, which find in general and then maybe like the culture of music you know you've got like bands like led zeppelin that were kind of singing about like norse gods ah uh-huh, interesting yeah caravan you know caravan like uh the canterbury band they were you know mm. for instance they they were doing like major folk tours and you know singing about like again like weird old myths and legends so mm. i think it was like a real cultural thing um and yeah, it's probably for a director at the time, it's just such a great genre to delve into and just go crazy with. And I suppose the thing is, a lot of the time with folk horror, not always, but some of the time, it's it's quite restrained in terms of, you know, violence and proper on-screen horror and that kind of thing. So I, I suppose you can get away with a lot more and appealing to a wider, broader audience, especially domestically on, on your television set. You know, it's that you could go out to the whole family even though under the surface there's something really kind of sinister and weird about a lot of these things we're about to talk about, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah the, the feeling of the uncanny is like really yeah. predominant in all of them. Um, but yeah, it's, it, is, it is terrifying. When you start going through all the children's TV, um, <laughs> there is just stuff there which there would, there'd be no way whatsoever that you get on TV these days. No. Um, so yeah, we were really lucky to at least have them in existence in DVD format or Blu-ray. But Exactly, yeah. yeah. The, they're out there to, for all to see now, which is nice. Yeah, yeah, nightmare fuel. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so let's talk a little bit. W- w- what we'll do is we won't talk about anything in kind of big spoilery depth because I think a lot of these things are probably quite obscure. A lot of people listening to this might not have even heard of some of these things, especially if there are listeners outside of Britain because some of these things are very British, aren't they, as well? Uh, but a lot of them are really worth tracking down, actually. They're really interesting strange things that are actually quite accessible now you can get them on dvd you can even stream them on youtube some of them and things like that so we'll sort of go through some recommendations and discuss them in uh, in some depth and uh, and see what we recommend sounds good um okay so what should we start with should we go in chronological order and go with kind of one of the earliest ones on the list and sort of work our way through Fantastic, sounds good. Um, okay, so I think a good one to start with is a, 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 it is a kids' television series from 1969 called The Owl Service. Listen, do you hear that? That what? That noise in the ceiling, listen. It's mice. Too loud. Rats, then. No, listen. They want their claws trimming. It's not rats. It is rats. They're on the wood. That's why it's so loud. Right, the first time I came. Shh. That's rats. As bored as you please. What? What's the kind of? What is the plot of the owl service? Would you say? Oh wow! I mean, this this is such a strange program, but yeah. it's um, it's like a family who are newly kind of. Um, I guess well, the, the mum and the dad are like newly yes, together. Yes, that's right. So it's kind of a stepbrother and sister, isn't that's it? That's right. Together, yeah, yeah. And that they're staying in this crazy old manor uh, in the middle of nowhere, uh, and it's it's got like a very strange out of place sensibility to it, where mm. effectively, the, the I guess like at its base level to summarise, it's like the lead girl finds a box of crockery, and in doing so, she uncovers this pattern which has this weird legend attached to it. Yes. Um, a, about this woman that fell in love with another man and effectively was turned into flowers. Yes. Well, you know, of course. Um, and it's <laughs> so strange. And amidst that, 
I mean, I can only say I was just really pleased that between episodes you get a recap. And it's the first time I think I've been like, oh, wow, this is so handy because none of it really makes sense a great deal. I don't know how you found it, but... Absolutely the same. The recaps were a godsend because, you know, you you watch half an hour of drama play out and you kind of go, what did I just watch there? What happened there in that episode? Somebody found a a tea set that may or may not have flowers or owls on it and (laughs) there is some weird story about this girl and is she... Is this this stepsister now possessed? Are they not? You know, what's happening? And then, yeah, you get these nice little recaps where you get this kind of clipped, you know, BBC or whatever it was, ITV, you know, voice going, previously, this has happened and these people <laughs> found this and they may be in danger because of this i was like okay clive a divorcee and margaret a widow have just got married and margaret's child allison now becomes clive's stepdaughter together with clive's own son roger they're now for the first time all on holiday together in a remote welsh valley uh, it's so jarring as well isn't it mm. that, i mean that voice doesn't even fit in at no. all with what's going on so it's just like it really throws you out before you're taken back in yeah um, yeah very strange i actually read the book of this at school oh, um wow. I, 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 I i when i was thinking about this and i was thinking i don't know why because surely this isn't on the syllabus but i think our english teacher must have really liked it and it was something that we read and i remember you know i was about 14 not a clue what the book was about i didn't <laughs> understand any of it um and you know half of it's in welsh and all of that kind of thing you know because it's right. it is it, it, it's set in wales isn't it we should say and it's like a kind of it's like a kind of welsh folklore sort of story a welsh folk tale i suppose yeah coming to life in sort of modern day isn't it that's that's sort of what it is so it, I, I suppose in terms of folk horror it's got that sense of the old this kind of lingering you know i suppose similarly to a ghost story where you've got these spirits of these lovers that are kind of trapped maybe in this house that that end up possessing these these people that move in but it's also to do with the earth and the rocks and and like you say the tea set and the house itself and the floorboards and the walls and the bricks so it's kind of it's got that kind of earthy folk nature to it as well doesn't it yeah definitely definitely um because it, it goes back to it is the old welsh legend of bloed that's think, it yes um who supposedly was made of flowers and turned into an owl after she killed her husband yeah um which i mean is crazy enough anyway um, but then, of course, you've got, you know, the local crazy guy who's the gardener. Yes. You know, it's like all the token folk horror tropes. Um, you know, it's really weirdly hypersexualized, like the TV version. Very. There's a lot of sexual tension between the the, you know, the characters, which yeah. I, I'm wondering if was in the actual original book, perhaps not. Uh, not that I could... T- tell from the book but sure. you know I, I i might have missed something that's the thing yeah it's uh it's very weird isn't it it is and it does it has that kind of underlying sexual yeah kind of it's because there's something just very sinister just sort of just under the surface of the whole story isn't there yeah and there is definitely again a sense of this kind of uh, the whole community knows about it. Everyone seems to know about this story and everyone knows what goes on in this house. There are moments when the characters will wander down to the post office or something and they'll overhear, uh, 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 you know, a couple of people going, oh, yeah, you know, have you heard about they've moved in and, oh, this year, this time it's flowers or this time it's like, like, as if, like, this thing has gone on over and over again through time and it will keep going sort of thing. Absolutely, yeah, which I suppose, again, is like fantastic folk horror trope that yes. all the locals in the villages are, are in with whatever legend or terrible yes tradition happens um, and again it's these outsiders that are sort of victim to it i suppose and figuring it out with us but it's uh it is such a strange and again so this was this was I, you know i'm assuming this was for kids this tv series wasn't it it was yeah i think so yeah yeah, yeah pretty yeah. much um yeah i mean it had some really cool freaky moments like uh, there's the peeling of the wallpaper and you start mm-hmm. to see the weird kind of design with the eyes underneath i think yes that's that was quite cool and it's got a really odd soundtrack where it's kind of like um almost like um like a harp and then you've got weird kind of uh scratching sounds like torn paper yes it's really hard to describe Yeah, again, I have no idea what the appeal, what what the kind of translation there was as a children's TV program because it is so avant-garde and so 
bizarre. It's more like a, an art film, I guess. Mm-hmm. Put Absolutely. And it's something that we talked about quite a lot with um, with the M.R. James BBC Ghost Stories as well. There, there is something completely kind of uh, oblique and, and art house about these stories a lot of the time where you don't really 100% know what's going on and again it just it feels so strange now in today's tv climate to see that kind of stuff you know unless you're watching twin peaks you're not going to get something that is this kind of art house on main network television are you it's crazy you're not and i, I, re- I think it's a shame because that really has kind of made them almost timeless yes um, it has yeah you know, those kind of tv adaptations because um they really stand that you know the, the test of time that the they're very much their own thing and mm-hmm. um yeah they're kind of they're stunning in the way that they're, they're conveyed but I don't know, perhaps studios just are a little bit fearful of doing anything that experimental. So, yeah. you, you know, we just don't get it anymore. Absolutely. They're not for everyone. That's the thing. I, know, I can imagine a lot of people just going, what the hell is this? You know? <laughs> yeah. But the owl service is worth a watch. I, I liked it. I watched uh, I watched it on a flight and uh, I quite enjoyed it. You know, so I think it's about eight episodes and each episode is only about 20 minutes or something. So you could get through the whole lot in two or three hours. Um, and I'm pretty sure you can. You, they're available on DVD and you can also watch the whole lot. Every episode is on YouTube, actually. So it's actually very easy to to get hold of and take a look at if you're into that kind of thing. And it has got, like we say, it, it is predominantly for kids, but it has got some proper creepiness to it. Um, and it's a weird, quite intriguing story that you, you kind of try and figure out and, and unpick as you go. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly something which is, uh, it's, yeah, perhaps not the easiest of watches, but it's, it is really intriguing just to see like how, um, I guess, a story like that is translated into TV and uh, and still, like, really, as I say, really fantastically eerie moments of, you know, the thing which is scratching the loft. and That is creepy, yeah. That's that's great. That's really great. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it's definitely, I think it's probably, in truth, my least favourite of <laughs> the yes, folk horrors. Yes, fair enough, fair enough. Okay, let's move on to the next one then. What's what's next on our list? Uh, I think it's Robin Redbreast. Perhaps. Nice, yes. There's something wrong, Jake. I don't know what it is. They're keeping me here for something, making sure I can't get away before Easter. I'm afraid. Please, both of you, don't be rational about it. Make allowances and come and get me as soon as you can. I should be very careful with this one, Grace. Just hang on to it for a few days so it doesn't get lost in the post. Uh, so this is uh, this is from 1970. This was first broadcast in December 1970 on BBC One, and it was part of a series called Play for Today, wasn't it? So it was essentially just a series of kind of short one-off plays. Um, they were, well, actually, they weren't even short. They were kind of film length, weren't they? They were sort of anything from sort of 60 to 90 minutes, I think, these plays. Um, and uh, and th- th- this this was definitely a much more exclusive for a kind of adult audience, wasn't it? I mean, you can tell this isn't for kids, this one. No, this is definitely, yeah, an adult audience uh, kind of programme. It's, um, it's really good. Yeah, I think probably it's one of my favourites out of all the TV adaptations. Yeah, it I think it's my favourite, yeah. Awesome. It's got, like, all the major ticks of, like, folk horror to it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, it follows the story of um, Nora Palmer, um, and she's recently broken up with her husband and moves out to the sticks where she encounters, like, a really weird mix of townspeople. Um, and there's like a Mr. Fisher at the the, the center of it, mm-hmm. um, and it, that that again is like very much um, a staple of the folk horror genre, where you seem to have in quite a lot of these stories like a state like a central figure with some kind of link to the past or like the old mm-hmm. ways. Mm-hmm. Certainly, Children of the Stones, um, yeah, and the Wicker Man, like Lord Summerall, yeah, you know, it's um, someone who gives off perhaps the pretense of a modern sensibility, but very much is carrying some strange old tradition that they want to incorporate in yes. village life. Yes, um, definitely. And he's almost like a kind of cult leader type figure yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. The character of Nora, she is a proper city girl, isn't she? She's a, she even works in television. She's a script editor for TV dramas, which is interesting. And, and you kind of see her at the beginning kind of swanning about with her other sort of media friends. And they are all very kind of modern and urbane in London. And then, you know, she's just been through a bad breakup. Uh, and so she takes, you know, she takes herself away to a retreat in the country. She buys a little cottage in the country. And yeah, you know, weird, weird, folky wackiness ensues, basically, doesn't it? When she kind of, she starts to meet all these locals. There's a strange uh, sort of housemaid who cu- who comes and, uh, you know, comes and cleans for her called Mrs. Vigo, who's very odd. And uh, as you say, you've got Mr. Fisher at the centre of it, who's this kind of, he's just, he comes around sort of pretend well with the pretense of being a sort of gardener doesn't he yeah yeah he's really interesting because he's um yeah he just kind of lets himself in yeah by looks a bit a lot in um, a lot of different scenes and um 
yeah, as you say, I don't know if they kind of maybe set her in TV, which I suppose at the time was very cutting edge and yeah. makes such contrast about, you know, this person is really like a fish out of water amidst these insane villages that they're obviously hiding something. Definitely, definitely. Um, but yeah. And another thing I found really interesting as well, and you, you know, it felt quite, um, it felt quite progressive in a way for, for, for something from 1970. I might be wrong. I mean, there might have been loads of dramas like this at the time, but just this woman, this female character who was not just a married housewife. She was this single professional woman who had just come out of a relationship, but she had never married. She wasn't interested in kids. There was a, there's a whole arc in it. I don't want to give anything away, but there is a whole arc about her wanting to have an abortion and, you know, being very much sexually active woman. She has contraception. There's a whole scene involving her diaphragm. You know, there's all this stuff, isn't there, where I thought, oh, it's a really interesting, you know, again, quite... It felt like it must have been quite ahead of its time for a BBC TV play from the late 60s, you know. And again, maybe we've talked a bit about this with the Unholy Trinity and just this kind of era in general that things were changing, weren't they, in Britain in the late 60s, early 70s. You know, there was this kind of sexual revolution and there was this slight fear from from the older generations of what was becoming of the younger generations, these kind of liberal free love types. And, and then you get these kind of old you know old middle england types who think that the whole country has gone to gone to pot or gone to hell or you know gone to satan or whatever you know so it feels like it kind of reflected that a little bit yeah very much uh, there's something i wanted to ask you about mrs viger something seems to be missing from the bathroom i wondered if you'd moved it what's that then well um it's a it's a, a small well a cat no, not a hat, you know. Um, a contraceptive cap, in fact. A duck. I mean, one uses it. Never mind, it doesn't matter. I must have mislaid it somehow. She, as you say, she's like uh, really strong willed, like, yeah. uh, you know, a passionate, um, you know, one woman of the times, I yeah. guess. And yeah, she, so I mean, like for her when, um, yeah, without giving too much away, but she finds herself in a situation where she is like confined uh, within the, the context of such a small community, then yeah, you can see, I suppose that would have had like a real um, resonance at the time of just being quite a horrific situation. I, I feel like it must have in some way been a little bit inspired by Rosemary's Baby from a couple of years earlier. It feels to me like a, like a folk horror British rural version almost of Rosemary's Baby, don't you think? Yeah, definitely, definitely. There's some like really weird like moments um, as well, which kind of felt off kilter where, mm-hmm. uh, though, yeah, it's got the definite Rosemary's Baby, quite dark undercurrent to it, but like yeah. quite weird comedic moments that they've yes, thrown in there. Which yes, yes, yes. Well, that's it. Like- it's, it's that idea of like, you're kind of laughing at these these weird country folk to begin with but then actually oh shit there's something much more sinister you know very similar to Rosemary's Baby isn't it but yeah all the Wicker Man even or a lot of these movies like what what at first appears quaint and then turns out to be really dangerous essentially yes exactly yeah I thought the performances were all great I thought Anna Cropper who played Nora really kind of holds it together she's brilliant yeah, you know she sort of carries the story um, and it's it, interestingly you know we talked a lot about music in, in folk horror there is not a single bit of music in this actually is there even through the credits and the title and you know at the end there there's it's just silence it's just the sounds of sort of nature and the surroundings and that kind of thing definitely yeah i, I really like the scenes where it just kind of pans across and you see maybe like the um the tree line silhouetted mm. on like a cluster of trees um or you just have like um yeah the wind kind of blowing yeah um you know those elements which i really think help build the atmosphere yeah um but yeah no you're right it's uh, it is it doesn't really have like any kind of music but i think that really helps, yeah. Yeah, well, that's quite that's like quite a lot of the M.R. James adaptations, isn't it? Whistle yeah. and I'll Come to You, you know, no music. And again, that kind of stark black and white, and this has that as well, doesn't it? You know, it feels like it, it's a little bit in the kind of Lawrence Gordon Clark tradition, this this one, doesn't it? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, um, it, it really stands apart. Um, mm. I've seen a few of the play for today's, and yeah, it's, it's definitely memorable. They're definitely one of my faves as well. It's definitely worth checking out. It is, um, it's, it's a proper film length. I think it's like 70, 80 minutes, something like that. And it's available on DVD. You can definitely you get a BFI DVD or Blu-ray of, of it, can't you? Yeah, yeah, you can. Uh, I've definitely seen it on Amazon. Um, Great, you can definitely get it there. So yeah. um, that should be fine. Lovely. Oh, a black cat has just walked past me. Is that good luck or bad luck? I don't know. It's kind of bad luck because he's going. Where's my dinner? Now so. <laughs> uh, there's an extraordinary thing. I put a figure on my shawl to give it some perspective, and if you look, you see there's someone standing there, just where I put him. That's uh, nature imitating art for you, Mr. Paxson. 
Okay, well, next on the list, I mean, now we're sort of into the early 1970s, it seems like it's probably a good chance to talk again about some of the BBC ghost stories for Christmas. Uh, last series, me and Michael Blythe talked about specifically the ones that I think very much feel like ghost stories and mainly Whistle and I'll Come to You. That was the sort of one we talked about in depth, which, you know, obviously has it, it has such a kind of, it, it, I mean, it has elements of folk, definitely, in the way that, that, you know, this kind of, this old artifact is kind of uncovered from the earth. But... In the look and feel of it, it's such a ghost story, isn't it? The kind of the creeping, sh- the, the white sheet appearing at night and all of that kind of thing. It really is. And yeah. um, and that whole thing of the shroud, I mean, even back then, you just kind of look at it and think, how how do you do that? It's such like a <laughs> weird special effects that, that is so effective. Yes, yes. I mean, very briefly, are you a fan of Whistling I'll Come To You? Did you like it? Oh, it's incredible. Um, And yeah, I guess going back to uh, you saying about the lack of music within it, which yeah. is amplified so much by his strange, like, slowed down guttural groan yeah. when... I mean, that is one of the most, yeah, it is literally like having, well, I suppose it's, you know, the same experience as having a nightmare. It's that yes. you're trying to talk, but you can't, and you're yes. kind of trying to wake yourself up. So every year after that, you know, we continued this kind of BBC ghost story tradition. And, and actually more and more, they started to, to go more in a kind of folky direction, it feels like. that. Do you have any personal favourites of uh, other than Whistle and I'll Come To You from, from this series that are more of a folk horror tradition? I would say probably uh, at the top of my list would have to be Warning to the Curious, yeah. which is just pure horrificness, but it's so fantastic. It um, is. It's, I really I like Whistle and I Come to You's kind of, it's wonderful, but I really feel it's almost like slightly romanticised now because it's mm-hmm. such like the go-to favourite, but it is. Warning to the Curious, like, I mean, the ghost in it is so malevolent and so monstrous yes um, and relentless that yeah no it's it's a definite favorite yeah i absolutely love it as well um and it, it uh, i i really enjoy um the one from a couple of years later in 1975 called the ash tree which yeah. uh, actually you know i feel like of all of them has the most kind of folk vibe to it it's it's because it's because it's it's got that kind of it flashes back and forth um, to a sort of sort of proper kind of old school sort of witch trial England as well. It has that kind of witch finder general feel to it almost of this woman being tortured and interrogated and that kind of thing. Of whom may we seek for succour but of thee, O Lord, who for our sins are justly displeased. Yet, O Lord God most holy, O Lord most mighty, O holy and most merciful Saviour, Deliver us not into the bitter pains of eternal death. So it's definitely um, a little bit more shocking and and, and g- gratuitous as well than some of the other ones that are more restrained. Yeah, no, it feels like it's really laid out for all to see. It's, um, uh, yeah, like, that. I mean, the monsters themselves, the actual, the, the babies mm-hmm. um, are, are, like, absolutely terrifying. Yes. Um, And the way the night shots are, are kind of filmed were so great. Where it's almost like at dusk, so everything's silhouetted. So yeah. you just get a, um, a suggestion of something dark moving in the trees. Yeah. And even when you catch, like, um, uh, obviously the the uh, the guy that's been killed in the house. Yeah. Uh, again, not giving away too much. Um, just you know the suggestion of things kind of pulsating on his body. Mm-hmm. It's really d- just fantastically done. Um, but yeah, um, it should be said. Uh, uh, John Repian and Liam Moore did a fantastic comic book adaptation of the Ash Tree, which did they definitely posed uh, like direct homage to the uh, to that adaptation. Oh. It's really worth seeking out. Yeah. It's really wonderful. Well, that that, that TV adaptation was um, it was adapted by David Rudkin, who also did Pender's Fen, which we'll talk about in a minute. And that that has a definite kind of th- th- there's something about those two as well that are even more kind of oblique and and difficult to follow in a way even more art house than the others um the ash tree kind of deliberately i think is quite disorientating the way that like you say it's all set at dusk and they have one actor playing two roles kind of himself and his own ancestor yeah and it kind of seamlessly jumps back and forth in time and you're not entirely sure what's happening in what timeline and yeah you know very much focus on there's a lot of imagery of the the tree itself the ash tree the woods uh the, a, a hare at one point you know as in a rabbit you know and uh it feels a lot more like it kind of about the nature and the landscape as well just this kind of shots of like or panning shots i should say of like mm-hmm. countryside looking kind of bleak and misty yes um, you know certainly lost hearts does that really well as well yes yeah um, those you know it really kind of pays uh, i suppose plays up the angle of just how remote these locations are and disparate from the rest of the world definitely definitely and another one i want to talk about is one that doesn't get talked about much um uh, richard wells mentioned a couple of weeks ago is this is his favorite of all the bbc ghost stories for christmas and it's a non mr james one called stigma from 1977 
no. Is the ambulance coming? Yes. Well, has she got us on the wall? I can't see anything. Did they say how long it'd be? But again, kind of the story, it feels very, very folk. It was um, an original story. It was the first one of the series that was original story about this woman uncovering this old stone that was under her driveway. And as soon as she touches it, something very strange starts to happen to her. She starts to just inexplicably bleed basically she suddenly finds that she's covered in blood she doesn't know where it's coming from and she can't seem to find a wound but every time she keeps cleaning herself up all this blood starts to appear again it's like she's bleeding out and doesn't know how or why it's really kind of horrible isn't it and yeah. nightmarish it really sets itself apart i think as yeah. well from the other ghost stories called i mean i suppose even a warning to the curious which is so violent yeah um, but you never really see any blood or anything yeah um whilst this is you know really in your face and, yeah and it's it, like the whole way it kind of the, the story starts and it seems to just finish um yeah it does really brutal um but yeah again centering around this kind of monolithic stone which has been in the the ground for eons and has been disturbed by a modern influence yeah which, builders and yeah, completely. yeah cranes and stuff <laughs> like that yeah no absolutely it has all of those themes to it it has the bleak ending that a lot of folk horror has actually a lot of folk horrors have very downer endings actually they do yeah uh you know from the obviously the helicopter not turning up and rescuing you know sergeant howie it's, yeah it's totally it keeps in that vein um yeah, it's it's a weird one. Um, I, I just love the the bleak tone to it, and mm-hmm. yeah, I think more folk horrors today could uh, definitely learn something from from that kind of style of filmmaking. Yeah, definitely. The BBC Ghost Stories for Christmas. I know we've uh, recommended this to death uh, in the last series, but again, if you haven't seen any of these, get the box set. It's a wonderful box set you can get online. And actually, all of these individual ghost stories are available on YouTube as well. You can stream all of them. They're only about, I think the longest of them is probably about 40 minutes long. So they're very easy to watch. Um, And uh, from a folk horror point of view, definitely those three, I would say, are Warning to the Curious, The Ash Tree and Stigma, all amazing and very creepy. (laughs) Um, All right. So let's move. We've mentioned this briefly. Let's move on to Pender's Fen from 1974. This has got to be, I think, one of the weirdest on the list from my point of view I I was completely baffled by it (laughs) and so they come before the throne of God this really felt like an art house film yeah so avant-garde and I just really strange the the contrast between what was going on or what seemed to be initially going on with maybe like a young boy just maybe like finding a sexuality and yes then slowly stemming into just mad folkloric kind of um yeah full-on like uh apparitions and, yeah yeah you know, like demons and um yeah visions of uh kind of um ghosts i guess like on top of hilltops it's really really bizarre yeah very odd what's the kind of overall plot then for people who've never heard of this do you think i mean what would you what could you say about it to sum it up yeah it's got it's quite a weird plot yeah Um, basically it follows um it's set in a small village in penvin in pershaw and uh worcestershire Uh, so you kind of amidst the uh you know the malvern hills um and it follows like stephen who's a vicar's son so yeah He's obviously quite restrained uh, in terms of his life. He's got a very strict authoritarian father. Mm. Um, he's kind of obsessed with Elgar. Yeah. Um, it's really odd. Um, but basically, it's his experiences. What what I took away from it, that basically it's his experiences as he kind of discovers his own sexuality mm-hmm. um, and starts somehow becoming involved with supernatural occurrences relating to King Pendo, who's the last king of Mercia. Yes, yeah. So, yeah, and it's as avant-garde as it sounds. I mean. Yeah, it is, isn't it? It starts off, because um, it's, it's directed by Alan Clark, who, you know, was known for these kind of quite um, gritty, you know, real life kind of, I mean, he did scum and stuff like that, yeah. you know, and... and and this, I thought, I, th- I was really looking forward to it. And I thought at the beginning it started off kind of promising. There's this kid who's this kind of, yeah, like you say, he's, he's obsessed with Elgar music. And he's he's clearly this kind of intellectual snob, I think. Everything starts to change when he starts discovering his his sexuality. And then it just goes into these very odd kind of dream sequences and visions and yeah. weird. And, and to be honest, that was where it lost me. I think it... 
you know, we've talked about all of these in of, of having a sense of avant-garde to them. But this one, like you say, it really pushes it, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Th- this one, like the Owl Service, just kind of felt like a step too far. Yeah. Um, it's got these beautiful shots of, like, the rolling hills, which mm-hmm. are fantastic. And, yeah. yeah, very much like folk horror. But um, at the same time, um, you know, stuff with the, the kind of the mast fiend sat atop his chest when he mm. wakes up in the middle of the night. Um which I guess is kind of linked in with the the his encounters with the milkman as well, which were right, yeah, very strange, yeah. Um, but yeah, and then obviously the ending, which is just so bizarre, with like the the figure on top of the hill, yeah, um, who yeah. then explodes. I think, yeah, if I remember it rightly. There's just a lot of to me. I think you know all of these other ones have a real sense of dread, of atmosphere, of you know. There's still this kind of fear, you know, even if you don't completely understand what's going on, you're still in it for the ride. I kind of switched off a bit in this one. I was a bit, uh, you know, it it because it there's a lot of just characters talking to one another as well about you know f- all kinds of things, philo- philosophical kind of deep and meaningful conversations and things, and it's a lot of just duologuing between two characters. And I got a bit bored, to be honest. Why is manichaeism a heresy, Dad? The world is a battleground between good and evil. Why is it an error to believe so? Manichaeans didn't believe exactly that. They believed that light was a vulnerable spark in man under constant attack from forces of darkness. They hoped for some great son of light himself to come to vanquish darkness and set light free. The scene where you've got this this demon sat atop someone which I guess is probably the most maybe it's like unsettling scene yeah was it? that was the best moment it's, yeah definitely obviously why it's on the cover and uh, yeah then suddenly you're in a different scene altogether as you say like having a dialogue which yeah. is quite banal and boring yeah um, and you you lose the tension of what was going on there um and i think it, yeah it just went a bit too far i mm. i i wasn't really held by it um no it's some yeah some great sceneries and some beautiful landscape shots but apart from that yeah there's there's not a whole deal of horror within it no there's not i think maybe that's what it is maybe it's just there's not enough horror um it it, i mean it did very well with uh, you know i think it's it is quite a kind of well respected piece of art these days and and a lot of people do love it and really recommend it um we're just not particularly uh, big fans but uh (laughs) but yeah you know at the time the times wrote you know uh, after it was first broadcast they said make no mistake we had a major work of television broadcast last night rudkin gave us something that had beauty imagination and depth um and vertigo magazine in 2006 described pender's fen as one of the great visionary works of english film and in 2011, Pender's Fen was chosen by Time Out London as one of the 100 greatest ever British films. So clearly there's a lot of love for it there, a lot of critical love at least. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's definitely maybe uh, intellectually challenging, I suppose. But uh, yeah, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, perhaps the problem is maybe, um, you know, the, uh, I've seen a lot of times in reviews, they, they kind of uh, compare it to William Blake's Jerusalem and like it makes, it really kind of uh, romanticizes the, the British landscape and maybe the landscape's too beautiful and perfect. And, mm-hmm. you know, against perhaps, you know, like for instance, going back to, um, you know, the uh, Lawrence Gordon Clark adaptations yeah. where, you know, you do have much more eerie atmospheres. Yeah. Uh, and with Robin Redbreast and, you know, the, mm-hmm. the landscape is kind of, it's the outside and, you know, these these characters usually safe within the confines of a house and it's mm. always about, like, nature trying to get in. Yeah. Um, where, you know, there doesn't appear to be a direct threat. It just looks like a beautiful landscape. So. Yeah. Yeah, Perhaps that's it. Yeah, that's it. There's not there's not as much of that kind of all encompassing dread is there somehow. No, sure. Um and 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 but no, neither that or enough cohesive narrative that you can kind of cling on to. It d- didn't really seem to have either for me and therefore it was a, yeah, didn't didn't work for me. I thought it was um pretty pretentious to be honest. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so Pender's Fen if you do want to check it out, you know, because a lot of people out there like it even though m- me and Tom do not. Uh then uh, it's it, it, you can get an, again you can get a BFI uh, DVD of it and Blu-ray of it um and that uh, you can order off Amazon. I think the BFI did a relaunch actually a few years ago. So I think, yeah. yeah, yeah, there should be some. You can get the DVD with some extras. And also, it's worth looking some of these up on BFI Player as well, isn't it? Some Definitely. of them, even if you don't want to order the DVD, uh, BFI have their own sort of streaming service with a lot of their own BFI releases. And you can get a free trial of that for, I think, 14 days. You can check out some of these things for free if they're on there as well. Um, okay, let's move on to one other biggie, another big TV series from the 70s. Uh, again, more 
sort of children's TV series end of the spectrum, but uh, very, very unsettling. So, Children of the Stones. There's the avenue. The Milbury Stones. The books say they were erected about 3000 BC. Maybe even earlier. So they're old in the Stonehenge? Probably. By the time Stonehenge was completed, people have been worshipping here for a thousand years or more. Worshipping what? The sun, maybe? Here's the circle. With the village inside it. Scary. What is? Not knowing anybody. Oh, you soon will. Suppose they all turn out to be nutters. Do we have to stay the whole three months? Yes, we do. Dad, stop! <laughs> This follows uh, the story of these uh, of a father and his son going to this remote village, um, uh, and the village itself has this mysterious set of stones um, which carries this old legend attached to it. Um, and again, encountering very similar to um, Robin Redbreast, another character who's like uh, the owner of the local manor, and he's got um, like a whole kind of alchemist vibe going on, um, and it's and he's got like a sensibility which you know and an interest which dates back to old. Uh, dark traditions related mm. to the village um and it's it's really strange because it kind of borders on sci-fi as well um mm-hmm. with an element of um uh, like a meteorite to it yes. so yeah um it's it without giving too much away it's it, it, it's really interesting it plays with time loops um and also the fact that they they're almost not even set apart just in terms of um uh, geography just the fact that they're kind of set apart in time and space almost yeah they are yeah I, um actually a little bit nigel neal-esque isn't yes, it i would say much. um you know the stone tape we talked about in our ghost series which again kind of merged the old with the new the sort of sci-fi element with ghost story element and that kind of thing and children of the stone definitely yeah like you say it has a has a bit of that to it doesn't it definitely uh this is definitely you know it has the feel of a of a kid's drama um but it's it's got enough really clever like you say clever interesting ideas there involving time loops and all kinds of kind of strange uh, big ideas that i think there's something for everyone to kind of enjoy in this isn't there yeah most certainly um it's it kind of lulls you into a full sense of like oh this is as you say like a children's drama and it's, mm. it's quite calm but i mean the ending is really horrific yeah it is yeah, like it the is. initial ending anyway you're like oh my god this is just <laughs> so traumatizing yeah um, it is it is and it's got the scariest opening credits of any television series i think like the opening theme tune and credits are really frightening there's this just it's just shots of these kind of old ancient stones with this absolutely you know diabolical sounding like choral music where it, it kind of escalates and escalates and it just sounds like people screaming at you by the end of the title yeah. sequence how did you find because personally i was a, i found it a little bit jarring the the choral music that suddenly just kind of came in out of nowhere yeah. I felt like ident- ident style music yeah how did, did you find it did yeah you- well uh, absolutely jarring weird um, but but it kind of worked in that way that it made me feel very uncomfortable you know it was yeah. very weird yeah <laughs> One more from the 1970s we've got to quickly cover as well. Uh, we did mention this very briefly in our Ghost series as well. Michael Blythe recommended uh, um, Nigel Neal's Beasts. And there's this was a sort of short story that Nigel Neal uh, wrote. Uh, and each It was a different story each episode, wasn't it? And each one, it was more involving kind of monsters and nature and that kind of thing. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, it was a really different take on, I suppose, the, the horror trope. Mm. Um, so yeah, uh, rather than it being quite so sci-fi, it's a bit more... Yeah, as you say it's related to you know one's related to a dolphin one's related That's right, to yeah. uh, a, a thing uh, mm-hmm. which is um, animalistic in nature um, but with like a witchcraft kind of background which mm. yeah that was baby which um, that comes up quite a lot in kind of top 10 scariest moments <laughs> I, I rewatched it actually just before our chat, and it is really, really creepy, really good, and it really, really well paced. It works well, I think. Yeah, um, it feels very much like a play for today as well, like the setting. Yes, it does. It does. So basically, to give you the background, it's it's, it's about this couple, and they move um, as ever. You know, they move from the city to the country in this little cottage. Uh, the 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 husband is a vet, and the wife is is pregnant. The, and the the vets previously has come from this obviously very kind of suburban or urban sort of um setup where he's 
mainly operating on um, pets and kittens and he's basically very upset about this and very frustrated and he's moved to finally get the chance to to work on a farm and be help you know working with cows and he's very excited about this whole thing isn't he um and uh, and and the, and the poor wife is basically at home pregnant and she uncovers she's got builders working in this cottage and they uncover some sort of old vase and inside this vase this urn is this dead what looks like a kind of petrified animal um and the the vet surmises that it might not have even been born it might have been like an animal fetus or something of some sort and uh, and then once they uncover that these weird things start to happen inside the house and things that affect her and her pregnancy as well um it's creepy isn't it it's really creepy um mm. i really love the way it plays around with like um you know the tradition of like the witch's bottle where yes. you've got like this this bottle that's supposed that you'd be able to kind of put your you know your fingernails in yes. or like even your urine and take it elsewhere to get like a witch's attention off of you or but also the fact of like you know the great tradition of um medieval times they'd put like a mummified animal up in like the eaves of a house mm-hmm. to, to keep a witch away so i guess it's kind of like um some sort of an inflection of those yeah um and it's instead it's yeah it kind of it stirs something up which has been long uh, forgotten about yeah yeah uh, it's really weird it's just that ending is so unsettling yes it shouldn't be but yes. somehow it still is it's so funny because we've, we've said this so about so many of them <laughs> we? and in the great tradition of all of these they they seem very everyday very kitchen sink at the beginning and then they escalate and they escalate and the atmosphere gets weirder and weirder and then as with so many of these the last two minutes one minute 30 is terrifying it there is a a moment like you say it's it's often listed as one of the scariest moments in in film and television uh it, basically this story this short story about i think it's about 45 50 minutes long it builds and builds and builds and then it has a really horrible uncanny terrifying closing sequence doesn't it that is just Absolutely. really and then it just abruptly ends and it's like oh that's it what, yeah what what, ha- what just happened <laughs> it's completely it's that, that again the sound maybe because the sound yeah. effect is so strange yeah and, you're kind of like you're a little bit. It's a, it is a bit like when I come to you. And you're like, what, yeah. what is going on? Like, yeah, it's very dreamlike. Yeah, nightmarish, dreamlike. It's 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 got all of those qualities that most of these have that we've we've talked about really, haven't they? There's a real trend in the way that they work and the way that they play out. Yeah, uh, it's really interesting. And it, it is, it, you know, I was thinking about this so that the husband character, the husband is a really annoying character in this, the he vet, is. and. Uh, it reminded me a lot. This must be a Nigel Neal thing because he, it reminded me a lot of a lot of the characters in the Stone Take. These kind of horrible, bolshy men who just shout. He just comes in and he's just really cross and he's ah! Don't come near me. Peter, Don't touch me. Peter, Can't you see I'm covered in muck? Oh, to me. do stop waffling, woman, and give me a hand. And then just kind of bursts in and then bursts out again, doesn't he? Uh, like pretty much every character in the Stone Tape as well. <laughs> yeah, like I'm a man and I'm doing manly things yeah. with machines, and you yeah. know, you're just a silly woman. You don't know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, and he's just the most unlikable character I've seen in a long time. He's awful. Oh, what the hell is that doing there? Well, I'm just trying to. Oh, I've had enough of me. But the lot drop right in it. Bloody pigsty. Oh, great idiot pork is about half a ton each, all shoving about, and down I went. Oh, put some disinfectant on that lot, will you? It's probably done for, but please try. Yeah. A lot of those kind of feel like, um, you know, the play for today style. Like, mm. I mean, this certainly feels like a play for today, but it's that kind of like uh, using the old style of actor, which is just like, I'm acting, and yes. I'm, uh, you know, just... Uh, but acting here and acting there like yes, being very exactly. loud with it very stagey isn't it stage acting that's yeah. what it feels like I'm projecting yeah. my acting all over the screen and I may as well tell you I finished with Dick so Beasts is available on DVD I think there were only a handful of episodes and the best one the one that everyone talks about is the one we've just talked about which is Baby you can again what you can definitely watch that on YouTube because I did this week you search for Nigel Neal Beasts Baby and you'll find the whole horrific thing to watch on YouTube it's, it's definitely worth a watch isn't it it is it's, it's traumatizing but yeah, it's fantastic it's very very good um okay anything else you want to mention any other sort of interesting uh, tv nuggets from the 70s yeah sure well, i suppose uh tv in the 70s was well known uh the dark side anyway certainly for um for the public information films so like the public warning films mm. that you don't really get anymore where they you know tell kids obvious things like you know don't go and get frisbee out of a pylon if you throw a frisbee in there yes um you know the spirit of dark water which mm-hmm. was so haunting and terrifying um where you'd have this kind of i think it's like a he's like a mini 
hooded figure um, and he's observing children basically falling to their deaths yes, yes. at lonely water spots. Um, I think he's voiced by Donald Pleasance. It is Donald Pleasance. I am the spirit of dark and lonely water, ready to trap the unwary, the show-off, the fool. And this is the kind of place you'd expect to find me. But no one expects to find me here. It seems too ordinary. But that pool is deep. The boy is showing off. The bank is slippery. Brilliant. So it's basically, is, is it, is it, it's a public service. It's basically saying to children, don't play on your own around water. Is that right? Because <laughs> you will die. You will die. If you if you poke water with a stick, basically you'll be dragged in. Yeah, uh, and, that was and, the go-to. And did they just used to play these as like commercials, like just in amongst other programs or something? Or were they kind of allocate, you know, is that is that what, how it worked? I'm not really sure how these things worked. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Um, maybe, uh, you know, when you went to the cinema as well, like mm-hmm. there were kind of obscene old style uh you know kind of projections where they've had stuff like that come up before so yeah i mean you know imagine going to the cinema and then you you get some you know just a short horror film effectively which they covered up as a public information exactly what it is they're only like five minutes long yeah that that one we talk about yeah it's it's brilliant that's probably one of the most famous ones isn't it and it has it's like it's like donald pleasant's basically playing death isn't it (laughs) and he's narrating it and he's going oh stupid children brilliant you know this branch is weak rotten It'll never take his way. But I mean, there was that one, of course, and then there was uh, Apaches, which yes. Edgar Wright cited as like one of his scariest moments. Yes. Um, with the children dying on a farm, which is just th- so horrific. Yes. I, I rewatched it for the first time in ages the other day, and I mean, the fact that it kind of finishes and they're all dead, and they're like. Well, we're now haunting this farm. I mean, it's just so bleak. What What was that one about? What did they die of? Many things, but basically anything farm related. Uh, <laughs> and it was a group of kids playing. I think they're playing cowboys and Indians. Yes, and were around farm machinery, and they range from I think one falls into like a slurry pit. Oh god! One gets on a tractor when the farmer gets off, and then like drives down a hill and crashes one drinks paint i think or poison or something it's like a british rural final destination film it is with with like very young children brilliant (laughs) brilliant and again all of these are available to watch on youtube they're like five ten minutes long and just chilling it was a dark time the 1970s clearly (laughs) it was it was i mean death was all around us yeah it was (laughs) the era of you know characters like nosy bonk which you know that horrific (laughs) character which comes up again and again in (laughs) terrifying uh benjamin allen the guy who wrote the X Files, mm. um, you know, cited it as uh, another inspiration recently. So, you know, Pipkin's horrific children's TV. Yeah, um, Wurzel Gummidge. Wurzel Gummidge, of course. Terrifying. <laughs> Got the obvious folk horror. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's move into the 21st century because, the, you know, again, I think there's been a few th- there's been a few things we'll just talk about very briefly um, over the last sort of 20 years that have kind of brought it back. You know, people have talked a lot about kind of folk horror revival and that kind of thing. I think we can't not mention uh, the big BBC comedy um, that, you know, launched about 20 years ago and, and then recently came back, The League of Gentlemen. Oh, God! It's nice to see you again, Dave. How grown up! <laughs> Um, obviously, you know, predominantly a comedy, and it is absolutely hilarious. But uh, those guys, you know, Mark, Mark and Reese and, and Jeremy Dyson and Steve Pemberton, they're very good at balancing horror with comedy. And I think that even though it is a sitcom, it is a sketch show, you can tell that there are moments of pure horror that they do insert into it that they want to be taken seriously, don't they? Yeah, totally. Um, it's uh, it's a really interesting mix of, you know, there's obviously loads of nods to such classic horror films from over the years. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, Don't Look Now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, th- you know, the fact of this, following the character of the Reese plays, yeah. where you're like following him into this this really strange town, this Royston Vasey, uh, and yeah it carries that sensibility of folk horror completely to the core yeah it does so for anyone who doesn't know about the league of gentlemen any international listeners maybe i mean it is it was a bbc comedy show that started off life as a a a kind of sketch comedy really but it's all set in this one town up in the north of england called royston vasey and it's very much it's very much poking fun at kind of middle england and northern england isn't it and the the fact that all of these people are very very local uh it's all a little bit they're all a little bit weird and it's essentially these 
these four actors, Mark Gatiss and Reece Shearsmith and Steve Pemberton, they, 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 they play everyone in, in, in this town, don't they? In all of the kind of central characters and all of these very weird and wonderful and very dark characters, some of them. Yeah, some of them really go fantastically dark. <laughs> very which... dark. Some of the comedy goes in very dark places, doesn't it? <laughs> And what started off as a kind of sketch comedy then became in its third series a kind of drama. It goes even weird, doesn't it? It kind of loses the laughter track and it goes into some deep, dark, weird places even more so in its third series. Yeah. And then there was a film as well. And then it came back recently uh, over Christmas for another three-part special sort of 20 years on in sort of set in Brexit Britain. So very interesting. And again, all of them all of them dabble in horror and there was one in particular there's a christmas special that they did which is i mean it is literally a kind of portmanteau horror isn't it it's it's three individual stories and that is when they went full full horror it felt like okay, boys. this is no longer a rehearsal enjoy this performance wolf it will be your last <laughs> whether or not you call it folk horror i don't know it's kind of it draws from all kinds of horror a lot of gothic stuff um but but there was definitely i think that fundamental kind of insular isolated rural community is at the center of all of the league of gentlemen isn't it so yeah definitely um i uh, i think it was an interview recently with mark gatiss or i know it was rishi smith and he said about like the shop itself was based on the experience in uh i think it was rottingdean yeah near brighton and they went into a shop and one was kind of terrified and you know, it was very much like, can I, you know, can I help you? And Father yeah. Wallet outside the shop. Has he been into it? No, I don't know anything. <laughs> now, if you'll excuse me, officer, the shop is local. Well, uh, perhaps your husband saw something. Is he on the premises? He's up the stairs, cleansing the precious things of the shop. <laughs> he can't walk, you see, and he's blind. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, and after League of Gentlemen, I mean, those guys, like you said, they, 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 we've talked about them already. I mean, really, Mark Gatiss is the one who's kind of popularised the term folk horror. He's made documentaries about horror and folk horror and British horror. And uh, and these other guys, you know, Rhys Shearsmith and, and, and Steve Pemberton, they've also gone out and done uh, Psychoville and also Inside Number 9. And Inside Number 9 has definitely got some folk horror elements to it, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the trial of Elizabeth Gadge, which is the yes. go-to, the most folk horror, um, which was fantastic and really played up the whole kind of non esque aspect of like the witch hunts yeah um and the fact that obviously they kind of turn on each other which yeah. was totally yeah true to life brilliant what is your name george waterhouse and you have witnessed events which may be of some interest to this hearing well only this i did spy elizabeth gadge fly out the window on a shovel Whereas she rode to the Sabbath and did kiss the devil's ass and eat a baby's face off. Um, yeah, no, it's fantastic. It was really, yeah, really nice to see something, um, you know, done in that that kind of era. And, you know, it's, it's certainly something which you could easily imagine a TV series with them as well as Witch Hunters. That'd be amazing. That'd be brilliant. Yes, yes, yes. That would be good. I'd like to see the trial of Elizabeth Gadge, you know, across six episodes. Let's do it. Yes, <laughs> most definitely. <laughs> Moving into even more recently, over the last few years, especially during this, you know, what everyone's calling kind of a folk horror revival, there's been quite a lot of interesting US television series. Um, first of all, I think the one that's worth mentioning that a lot of people bring up is is True Detective. You ever see something like this? No, sir. Someone once told me that all your love, your hate, was all the same thing. It was all a dream. And like a lot of dreams, there's a monster at the end of it. Did you watch True Detective when it was on? I did. Um, I've only seen, in all honesty, I've only seen like first series because um, I started the second series, but I think it was the folk horror vibe which really kept me hooked. Yeah, me um, too. Me too. I gave up in the second series. But yeah. uh, series one in particular is, it, you know, I think it does have a lot of folk horror to it, doesn't it? Um, it was created by Nick Pizzolato, and I'm sure everyone has heard of this, but it obviously stars Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson. And it's kind of this very, what what might be a kind of very everyday cop 
mystery thriller um, sort of TV show of sort of solving this murder. But the murder is all wrapped up in this weird ritualistic stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the um, the references to uh, it's Chambers, um, King in Yellow, you know, mm. the, the classic book. Um, I mean, that that was really fascinating. Like uh, the, 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 the kind of the recital of the poem and... Um, is it like Kokosa? They're also talking about this kind of um, this mysterious place where I suppose the, they're trying to get to constantly, mm. where or like where the the heart of all the killings stem from, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. or the killer is, inhabits. So you get the impression that this killer from the start is almost like um, almost like a not, not actually like a real character. It's kind of like this, uh, yeah, this, like, this supernatural kind of, character. You yeah, know? this sort of ethereal presence almost or something. Yeah. yeah, which really sets it apart from other TV detective dramas yeah. where you really think, oh, you know, is it actually a a killer that they're hunting or is it something a bit more fantastical mm, um, yeah and but, there's this very just like strange oppressive atmosphere throughout the whole series isn't there as well again something that you don't feel like you get in a lot of cop d- dramas you know but it's this very odd weird atmosphere throughout the kind of builds and builds and again the more they kind of uncover about this strange community and who may or may not be in on it the kind of deeper into this weird trap they get and this still a sort of nightmare situation that they're in and it gets darker and darker doesn't it it's really good yeah they, they start to kind of their, their relationship starts to fall apart like they've mm. got a rocky relationship to begin with then that kind of fractures mm. um and the whole kind of the sense of the location, like um, it's in the south, isn't it? So yeah. You really get that sense of like the heat being really oppressive, and yeah, definitely. Being, like, you know, the, the buzzing of flies around like yeah. these horrific mutilation scenes. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah it's, it's really brilliant. interesting. I mean, that's what we're going to be covering in the next few weeks is the more sort of American stuff set in the deep south, and you know, not just southern gothic, but also movies like Texas Chainsaw, and and again, that you know, they do have that kind of real emphasis on the rural communities, you know, the the landscape the kind of weird macabre sort of uh, rituals of the community and old fashioned ways and that kind of thing. So it's definitely a kind of, there's a link there. I think there's is it was almost like the kind of U S equivalent of folk horror. It feels like. Yeah, definitely D- delving into like the voodoo side of things as yeah. well. Like, yeah, I, I can, absolutely imagine there's a wealth of folk horror to come from the deep South. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> There's another one that, again that's quite a big, quite a biggie that a lot of people have talked about, which is um, American Horror Story. Now, obviously, each American Horror Story, it's like it covers a different area of horror. They had a haunted house, they had an asylum, they had witches, blah blah blah. Um, there was one series from a couple of years ago called Roanoke, um, which you know, I don't know whether I I didn't actually watch all of it myself. Did you watch it? I have to admit, I've, I did attempt to get into uh, American Horror Story, and I've mm. tried to all different series, but I just can't get into. I don't know what it is like that the whole mindset for it I think yeah. probably the problem was it came with such like uh, glowing promotions of like this is terrifying and yeah. it just it never I never found it remotely no, scary it's, so it's it, it. It always starts off promising for me, and then it always kind of blows it. It goes a bit too far. It goes a bit too. It, it goes a bit too extreme and hammy. I think with most of them, yeah. It, they, they all they all kind of verge on camp, all of them. Um, but uh, the Roanoke one is specifically kind of about this kind of weird, isolated community, and it's got a kind of found footage vibe as well. And it's all done like a kind of documentary. Um, and it's interesting. They kind of play with the form. Um, but uh, I gave up about midway through because something happens about midway through and i just thought oh i've kind of run out of patience with this but you know i'm sure if you're a fan of american horror story you would have seen it um but you know uh, yeah again if it's if it's if you're a completist and you're looking to watch anything that is kind of folk horror related that's often cited as one of the big kind of folk horror television dramas from recent years really so worth a watch All right, so we've listed a load of good recommendations there. Most of them, especially the old ones, are quite easy to get hold of. Um, If you had to recommend one to start with, what would it be? I would say it's worth seeking out... uh, I I know it's the go-to, but I'd say the MR James, because, yeah, yeah, I mean, and if it was one, then it'd be warning to the curious. Nice, a warning to the curious. And you can definitely stream that easily. I've seen that, you know, on YouTube and those kind of places. Or, as we've said get the box set it's amazing definitely um i would think i would recommend robin redbreast as well i think that's a that's that's a favorite of these kind of newer folk horrors that i've looked at yeah yeah it's really interesting it's a it's a whole refreshing new take on it mm. um 
Yeah, yeah. It's, I, I suppose, like, for different reasons. One is curious is great. It's also terrifying. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's got some really horrific scenes. But, yeah, Robin Redbreast has, has the slow build scale, which yeah, is, is it worth does. it. Yeah, it totally. has that very Rosemary's Baby slow build vibe, which is great. Um, wonderful. And then just branching out of television, but just in general across cinema, what's your favourite folk horror? Do you have one? Uh again i suppose it's like the stereotypical one but it would have to be the wicker man I mean, of course it's, it's just so perfect um it's got all the tropes it does um, i mean uh, the tropes that probably it started i suppose um yeah but yeah it's, it's just so fantastic you can't fault it it's so rewatchable isn't it it's just wonderful it yeah, is yeah. totally yeah uh, uh wonderful and then a couple of other questions i ask everyone what's your favorite horror movie do you have a favorite um it would be well, i suppose in terms of film it would have to be the grudge um, oh interesting yeah yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Like, the original japanese one yeah do on yeah. yeah definitely yeah i, I mean it, it, it would be tight between the grudge uh the grudge and the shining because i do love the shining but yeah the grudge for pure like horror uh, i find it the most scariest of the horror films yeah most definitely yeah there are a lot of just brilliantly scary set pieces in that aren't there just there are. one after the other continuously you know and yeah. that kind of that j horror feel where you know there is such um skill in just crafting a really horrific face <laughs> yeah which, yeah <laughs> you know uh, it's been done so well in um, the ring and the grudge yeah and and obviously just set pieces which are just timeless definitely well. absolutely timeless yeah wonderful and then uh, anything else i was going to ask you what your scariest was unless it's that but have you got any others like your kind of scariest movie experience oh um well i suppose yeah it would have to be the grudge but in terms of like maybe for a tv film then certainly um ghost watch i would say oh, of course yeah yeah. yeah 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 that is like the most traumatizing thing i think i've ever seen um uh, did but... you watch it at the time when it was airing or i did yeah like like a lot of my school friends um, yeah yeah we were really young and you kind of grew up with these characters like sarah green um, yeah and uh, craig charles and just to get a face value because you know you're young impressionable kids yeah um but even now it kind of carries that weird sense of dread to it which is so odd and yeah strange i think just the old-fashioned style of filming to it which yeah yeah it's still really uncanny um but yeah no it's, it's perfect it's really great love it uh tom thank you so so much for joining me this week you've been a fountain of knowledge for all things sort of weird british tv it's great thanks so much it's been a pleasure <laughs> um where can people find you if they want to find you on social media or find your work or whatever where's best to go uh, sure. So my books are listed at, under my website, which is manoghost.com, mm-hmm. um, or you can find me on Twitter under the same handle. Um, and then, yeah, sure, Malevolence, Theory, and Hallows Fell are all on Facebook. So, um, yeah, people can easily find them there. Brilliant. Wonderful. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. And that's it for this week. Thank you so, so much for listening. And a huge thank you to my two fantastic guests for this week, Mary Wilde and Tom Burgess. Now, don't forget, if you want any information on anything that Mary's got coming up, or if you want to find anything that Tom himself has written, all of his details of social media and websites will be listed in the show notes. So get in touch with us. What did you think of this week's show? What do you think of some of these strange folk horrors from the 1970s? Get in touch. The email address is evolutionofhorror at gmail.com, or you can find us on Twitter at Evolution Pod or on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash evolution of horror. Now, I will update on Letterbox. There will be a list of every single title that we covered in today's show, just in case you have forgotten some of the ones we mentioned and you want to go back and find out what one it was that we recommended. There's going to be a whole list of all those titles. I will publish that list on Letterboxd so that you can go back and check out some of the ones that we recommended. Now, before I reveal what we're doing next week, don't forget you you can find us on all major podcast platforms, including iTunes, Stitcher, Libsyn, Podbean, all the usual ones. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, spread the word about us, and if you get a chance, leave a little rating or review. It really helps give the podcast a boost and helps us get discovered by new listeners. So next week, well, next week we're going to begin branching out away from the UK. Now that we've done the kind of classic British rural folk horror of the 60s and 70s, it's time to go a little bit outside the box. So what we're going to do is Uh, for the next couple of weeks we're going to go around the world and we're going to look at sort of international examples of folk horror from different countries in different eras. Next week is going to be a very special kind of East meets West episode. We're going to cover two movies with two different guests, each movie from very different backgrounds and traditions. I'm going to start off by looking at some classic American cinema, one that leans more towards the kind of southern gothic tradition but definitely has early elements of folk horror in there. I'm going to be joined by a new 
newbie to the podcast, Paul Ridd, and we're going to be talking about that 1955 Charles Lawton classic, The Night of the Hunter. Then we're going to go all the way across the world, over the Pacific, over to Japan. And in the second half of the podcast, I'm going to be joined by the BFI's Kevin Lyons, and we are going to be discussing that Japanese folk classic from 1964, Oni Baba. So there we have it, two masterpieces there, both of which we're going to be covering in spoilerific detail. If you haven't seen Oni Baba or Night of the Hunter, please do yourself a favour, go and track them down and watch them before next week. Now, unfortunately, neither of them are available to stream on any sort of subscription services, at least not in the UK, but you can get both on DVD and Blu-ray for quite reasonable prices on Amazon, or you can actually pay to stream and rent them online from all the usual places, such as iTunes, Google, YouTube, and Amazon. So hopefully, if you haven't seen them, it shouldn't be too difficult to track down these two cinematic masterpieces. So join me next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror.